Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and cloud computing has now become one of the essential skills that you need to learn in order to make it in the web development industry. And AWS, Amazon Web Services, is the most popular cloud computing service used by startups. So this whole course is about getting AWS certified for the Certified Cloud Practitioner, which is the entry-level certification. Uh, and the idea here is that by getting the certification, you are going to uh, be able to prove that you can work with cloud computing, prove that you can work with AWS, and you're going to have a lot more job opportunities available to you. So, you know, let's get to this and start learning about AWS. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and I'm going to try to answer all the questions you might have about the CCP, which is known as the Certified Cloud Practitioner, uh, to determine whether it's the right uh, certification for you. Okay, so the CCP um, is all about uh, AWS foundational knowledge. So what that means is that it can show that you know how to poke around and you can use the AWS console and you know uh, the general offerings from AWS. It's like a light version of the solution architect associate, okay? Uh, but the CCP has some very unique offerings, which no other uh, certification on AWS has, which is they have a strong focus on billing and business-centric concepts. Okay, and that's why it's going to make a lot of sense why a lot of people who try to obtain the CCP are in sales and management because it's going to give them that knowledge to help them inform VPs or CEOs the reasons why to use AWS. Okay, all right, so the next thing you're probably going to ask me is what value does the CCP hold? Well, it's not a gilded title. Uh, it can help superficially increase your AWS certification count if that's uh, something uh, that some companies care about. Uh, but it's not recognized as an important certification for developers on resume. So if you think by getting the CCP, it's going to help you get a job, uh, it probably won't help too much. If you were a bootcamp grad, uh, then it could be a good indicator that you're a little bit familiar with AWS. So uh, it can be okay in that one circumstance. But generally for developers, it's not going to help you uh, too much. All right, so maybe you're thinking so far, hey, Andrew, this doesn't sound that great. Why would I want to even bother getting this? And you might be thinking about skipping the CCP, but I'm going to tell you uh, that that is not what you should do. You should actually go get the CCP. And why is that? Well, it's for a totally different reason. It's because the CCP is going to help you build confidence, and it's a very easy win because it's the easy certification, because it's the most inexpensive certification. It's the perfect opportunity for you to uh, get comfortable for when you actually go take a real exam, okay? So the other exams, the associates, and everything beyond that are very difficult, and you don't want that to be your first certification you go for because you're going to go to the exam center and you're going to be very nervous or stressed out or something's going to go wrong. And so by taking the CCP and going to the test center, you're going to uh, uh, learn your test center and learn how you have to be on time and the, what the environment's going to be like, okay? And that is the big value out of the CCP. So that's why I want you to go after it. And also just some people, uh, they just should just prepare because they might get overwhelmed once they start with the Solution Architect Associate. And so it is a, a very easy way to uh, ease into the Associate certifications. All right, so let's talk about study time. How much time do I have to put in to pass this exam? Now, if you are a developer, so you're already working in the industry, you can pass this in less than a week. If you're a bootcamp grad, I'd say about 15 hours. So we're talking about a week and a half of study. And if you're in sales and management, you probably don't have a lot of developer experience or with a cloud infrastructure. So we're looking at 20 hours of study. But the thing is, is that you can, um, uh, you know, uh, book this exam a week ahead and use this course and you will pass because it is a very easy certification and it's not a huge time requirement, okay? So that just gives you kind of an idea of the time you need to put in. All right, so when it comes time to take this exam, you're going to have to go to a test center, which is partnered with AWS. And there are two uh, test center networks. We have PSI and Pearson View. Uh, and so... Uh, uh, before, the only way you could take this exam, you had to go in person to a test center. But now uh, that Pearson View is part of uh, uh, AWS, as in it's offering the exams through their network, uh, Pearson View is known for their proctored exams. So what is a proctored exam? That's when you have someone that is supervising or monitoring your examination and specifically for online, okay? So what that means is that you can sign up and schedule an online exam 
and through a, a web camera. And if you, uh, you would just take the exam and somebody would watch you to make sure uh, that you're not cheating, okay? So uh, now it's even easier to get ABIS certified because you can take this at the convenience of your uh, own home. But I would strongly recommend that you take it at an in-person test center if there is one nearby, just because uh, when you go for those harder certifications, they may not offer proctored exams. Uh, and so uh, I, I, at this point, I recommend that you try to go to a test center. But um, if you just want to get ABIS certified and you're really excited, uh, definitely go take it online. All right, and now we just have some uh, remaining questions here. So what does it cost to take this exam? It's $100 USD. It is the most inexpensive AWS certification. Um, it's going to take 90 minutes. Uh, that's the time that you're allocated during the, uh, the exam. It doesn't actually take that long. You could probably get it done in under an hour. It, again, it's not a very hard certification, but I do recommend that when you go to the exam, you maximize um, all of your time and review your questions. Uh, because it is a very good habit to get into when you take exams. There are 65 questions. The passing score is 70%. Uh, I think that actually is a hard number. With all the other uh, exams, it's kind of a floating number, so it's never exactly that amount. But I'm pretty sure for the cloud practitioner, if you get over 70%, you are going to pass. Okay. Uh, and then uh, when you get the certification, it's going to be valid for three years. So uh, it's going to be uh, with you for quite a long time. So there you go. Hopefully that answers all the questions you have about the uh, certified cloud practitioner. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. And here I have the exam guide pulled up because I'm gonna give you a quick walkthrough of it so you have an idea what AWS uh, wants you to know in order to pass this exam. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to scroll on down uh, to the content outline and just give the domains a read and understand the weighting of the actual exam. So we have four uh, domains here. We have cloud concepts, security, technology, and billing and pricing. And so uh, the uh, largest portion of the exam is technology at 36%. Uh, and billing and pricing is the lowest amount, which is kind of funny because I find that uh, the most valuable thing in the entire course is billing and pricing, okay? We're gonna learn a lot about billing and pricing on AWS here, um, but that's just how they weighted it. Uh, but let's just talk about these four domains so we understand what it is that we need to know for each of these domains. So for domain one, we need, to be, we need to be able to define the AWS cloud and its value proposition. We need to be able to identify aspects of AWS cloud economics, list the different cloud architecture design principles, okay? Now for security, uh, we need to know a variety of different AWS security services, and we need to know the shared responsibility model, okay? You need to know that for every single exam, it's always brought up like a hundred times over. Um, but yeah, that's part of the uh, security domain. Onto technology, uh, you're going to need to know um, all the core AWS services and also a bunch of other AWS services. And you're going to need to know global infrastructure, okay? So we're talking uh, regions, AZs, and edge locations, all right? Uh, and then onto billing and pricing. So we need to be able to compare and contrast various pricing models for AWS, recognize the various uh, account structures in relation to AWS billing and pricing, and identify resources available for billing support. So that is the content outline. So the next thing I wanted uh, to go over with you is the response type. So when you're taking the exam, you're going to be presented questions in one or, or the other format. So we have multiple choice and multiple response. So for multiple choice, uh, you just choose one out of four. Okay, and then for uh, multiple response, it's going to be uh, two or uh, more correct responses out of five or more options, okay? But generally, I find that it's two out of five or three out of six, okay? Uh, and then the last thing here is white papers. Uh, so white papers are generally core to studying for AWS. Uh, for the CCP, uh, however, you do not have to read a single white paper. Everything in this course covers anything that could possibly uh, pop up in these white papers here. Uh, and white papers are super boring, okay? But just so you know, uh, we have the overview of Amazon Web Services, Architecting for the Cloud, AWS Best Practices, How a AWS Pricing Works, cost management in the uh, uh, in uh, AWS cloud, okay? So those are your four white papers recommended. And then a fifth one, this isn't a white paper though, but they just say compare the AWS support plans. So you go to the webpage and you read about the support plans, okay? So there you go. That is the exam guide in a nutshell.
Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at what is cloud computing, which is the most important question on our journey to become a certified cloud practitioner. So what I've done here is I pulled up the textbook de definition of cloud computing, and we will read through this, and then I will give you a bit more context on uh, what is cloud computing. So cloud computing uh, uh, from the dictionary is the practice of using a network of remote servers hosted on the internet to store, manage, and process data rather than a local server or personal computer. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, to really understand that, we need to understand on-premise and cloud providers. So uh, now most people are using cloud providers such as AWS, uh, GCP, or Azure to run uh, their actual uh, workloads. Um, and uh, prior to that, everyone was doing on-premise. So what you would do with on-premise is you would own the servers. So that'd be the hardware and the software. You'd hire the IT people to configure those servers and those applications. Uh, you'd pay or rent the real estate to house all these uh, physical servers, and you would take all the risk. Now, uh, on-premise uh, is still well and alive today, and there's uh, definitely good reasons to uh, have an on-premise solution, uh, but a lot of uh, companies are now starting to uh, use uh, cloud providers. And so cloud providers are like AWS, GCP, and Azure, as I said earlier. Uh, and so here, it's someone else owns the servers, so you are not responsible for uh, that hardware, uh, and to different degrees, they will uh, configure the, the software layer for you. Uh, or you have control over it yourself, depends on uh, what kind of service you are using. Uh, they're hiring the IT people uh, and they're watching these servers around the clock for you. So you do not have to pay for that. And someone else is paying for or renting the real estate. So they are uh, buying the real estate to house these uh, servers, which are data centers. And uh, now you have a shared responsibility. So you're responsible for configuring uh, cloud services and the code that you deploy um, onto uh, these services. And so these cloud providers are going to take care of the rest for you, okay? So that is generally what cloud computing is. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at these six advantages and benefits of cloud computing. And so this section really is about why go with a cloud provider over on-premise, okay? And so let's jump into the first point here. So we have trade capital expense for variable expense. So with on-prem, you would have to pay for your data centers uh, and the servers. And so that would be an upfront cost where um, uh, with a cloud provider, you're paying on demand. So you only pay when you consume those uh, computing resources and pretty much nothing else. Okay, uh, moving on to number two, we have benefit from massive economics of scale. So uh, when you're using cloud computing, you have usage from hundreds of thousands of customers aggregated in the cloud. And so you are sharing the cost with other customers to get unbeatable savings, which you cannot get on-prem. Uh, the next point here is stop guessing capacity. So eliminate guesswork about infrastructure capacity needs. So instead of paying for idle or underutilized servers, you can scale up or down to meet the current needs. So where on-prem, you would just buy your servers uh, and they would either uh, be underutilized because they would just be way too big for the job or they're just not being utilized all the time. So moving on to uh, number four, in increase speed and agility. So with cloud computing, you can launch resources within a few clicks uh, within minutes instead of waiting days or weeks for your IT to implement uh, the solution on-prem. Uh, then number five, we have stop spending money on running and maintaining data centers. So uh, the idea here is that if you don't have to pay uh, for the servers, the IT staff, um, and a bunch of other stuff, then you can just focus on your customers, okay? So rather than uh, that heavy lifting of racking, stacking, and powering servers. And the last point here is uh, go global in minutes. Uh, so deploy your app in multi uh, multiple regions around the world with a, uh, with a few clicks. Provide low latency and a better experience for your customers at minimal cost. And so when you have an on-prem environment, that data center is, uh, I don't know how many people can afford multiple data centers, but uh, with AWS and cloud computing, you're gonna have uh, a lot more uh, reach. Okay, so those are the six advantages and benefits of cloud computing. And this definitely shows up on the exam, so you do need to know these six points.
Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at the types of cloud computing. We have three here for us. So we have software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service. And you can see that we have this nice pyramid here. I promise you it's not a, sch a scheme. It's just a, a way of showing how one is built on top of another, okay? So starting at the top here, we have uh, uh, software as a service, also known as SaaS. Uh, and these are for customers, okay? So the idea is that you have a completed product that uh, that is run and managed by the service provider. So you don't have to worry about how the service is maintained. It just works and remains available. So we had some examples of uh, um, uh, SaaSes here. Maybe you'd have your Gmail or your Office uh, 365 or your Salesforce, okay? Uh, going down to platform as a service, this is really intended for developers. Uh, and it removes the need for your organization to manage the underlying infrastructure and focus on the deployment and management of your applications. So the idea here is you don't have to worry about um, provisioning, configuring, and understanding the hardware OS. It just works. So you have an app, you push it. So for AWS, you have Elastic Beanstalk. Um, uh, then there's also Heroku, which is a very popular service. And then I believe there's one called like Engines for Google. Um, and then the last one on our list here is infrastructure as service. And this is really intended for admins. Uh, and so uh, when you're using AWS, uh, GCP or Azure, this is what uh, uh, infrastructure as a service is. So it's the basic building blocks for cloud IT. So it provides access to networking features, computers, and data storage space. So you don't worry about the IT staff, the data centers, or the hardware, but you have access to all those resources to build whatever you want, okay? And so obviously, a uh, if you wanted to build your own uh, platform as a service, you'd build that on, on top of an infrastructure service. And if you wanted to build your own software as a service, you could build that on top of a platform as a service or an infrastructure as a service. So there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at cloud computing deployment models. So there are three different kinds here. Uh, and so we're going to start with cloud on the left hand side, work on to on prem, and then talk about hybrid. So Cloud is where you are fully utilizing cloud computing. So here I have a few services such as Squarespace, Basecamp, and Dropbox. And it is very well suited for startups because it's extremely low cost. Um, it's great for SaaS offerings where um, with on-prem or hybrid, they might never get to the size where they need to uh, deal with a regulatory bodies or, or it's just the nature of the applications are not that complicated. Or if it's new projects or companies, uh, they don't have red tape uh, because they have existing infrastructure, okay? And they can uh, design to be 100% on cloud. So now going on to on-prem. Uh, so on-prem is when you are deploying resources on-premise using virtualization and resource management tools, and is sometimes called private cloud. And so uh, on-prem is still being utilized by um, a lot of companies today. Uh, and generally, you will see uh, uh, public sector, so the government uh, has on-prem data centers. When you're dealing with super sensitive data, such as hospitals, you have like um, health records, there is an aversion to putting that into the cloud, or you have large enterprises with heavy regulation, so uh, insurance companies. Um, and I mean, uh, these organizations are starting to uh, soften and uh, start utilizing cloud, but there are still holdouts and uh, uh, reasons, both technical and um, and uh, business or political reasons as to why you cannot use cloud, okay? Then you have hybrid. And so hybrid is where you use a combination of both cloud and on-prem. Uh, so you connect the two with um, uh, hybrid uh, services. Um, and so we see a lot of banks uh, using this, we see fintech or investment management, or even large professional service providers. And a lot of the reasons why is that they can adopt cloud, but they have legacy on-premise uh, environments, or um, some of their uh, customers or clients still are not comfortable with um, cloud computing. So in some capacity, they are using uh, uh, cloud, but it's totally possible that if they started from day one, they would just only use cloud. So there you can see I have CIBC, which is a bank. Then you have the C C CPP investment board. That's a investment board in Canada. Then you have Deloitte, which is a large professional service. So those are the three uh, cloud computing deployment models. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at AWS Global Infrastructure. And what we're going to uh, figure out here is where does all this cloud computing stuff run, okay? 
So we have uh, 69 AZs within 22 geographical regions around the world, and we have lots of edge locations, more than uh, available AZs, but what does that all mean? So AWS serves over a million active customers in more than 190 countries, and they're steadily expanding their global infrastructure to help customers achieve low latency and higher throughput. And so that global infrastructure are regions, AZs, and edge locations. So a region is just a physical location in the world with multiple AZs. An AZ is one or more discrete data centers owned by AWS. And then edge locations are data centers owned by a trusted partner of AWS and maybe owned by AWS themselves. And so now that we have that overview, we're gonna jump into uh, those uh, three uh, types of infrastructure. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at regions for the AWS global infrastructure. And so a region is a geographically distinct location which has multiple data centers, also known as AZs for AWS. And the, I've highlighted in red geographically distinct because that is the most important thing you need to remember about regions. Every region is physically isolated from and independent of every other region in terms of location, power, and water supply. Uh, every region has at least two AZs. So again, an AZ is a data center, so it has at least two uh, data centers running within that region. The largest region for AWS is US East, so that is North Virginia. Um, and uh, new services almost always be become available first in US East, and not all services are available in all regions, okay? So if you definitely wanna use a new feature or service uh, via AWS, your best bet is to switch over to US East. And US East One, which again is North Virginia, is the region where you see all your billing information. All right, and uh, you can just see here on the left-hand side, I have a bunch of flags uh, for uh, the countries where these regions run in here. I might not have all of them in here, but I definitely have a lot here. So you can see there's a lot of coverage here. So now that we know what a region is, let's just go take a look um, at uh, some of the features of uh, regions, okay? So I just hopped over to the AWS website because I just wanted to show you a little bit more about regions visually. And so uh, here we have, uh, our, uh, they say region maps, but these are really just uh, a particular continents that house a bunch of regions. So looking at North America, you can see we have uh, regions on the West Coast and the East Coast. And so we have Ohio or uh, Oregon, North uh, California, and we have Canada and North Virginia here, okay? Uh, and so you can see in Canada, there's only two um, availability zones uh, and they are working on a third one. It was just recently announced. So uh, AWS can always say that they at least have two AZs in every single uh, uh, region, but they're definitely coming close to being able to say they have at least three in every region, which is very important because uh, most companies or enterprises have to run in at least three AZs. Uh, so now going on to South America, you can see that there is a single region here, uh, and that is in um, uh, Brazil. And then we have over here in Europe, uh, so we have a few here. We have London, Stockholm, uh, Frankfurt, Paris, and uh, Brahim. Uh, and sorry if I pronounced that wrong. I've I've forgotten already. Oh, and then we have uh, Ireland. Okay, sorry, Ireland. I know you're you're there as well. Okay, and then on to Asia Pacific. So we have uh, mainland China, Sydney. Um, so that, I would I think that that would be Australia there, Tokyo, so that's Japan, uh, Seoul, so that is uh, Korea. Um, cannot say that, but that's another place in mainland China. And we have uh, another place in Japan um, and then uh, Mumbai, so I believe that is India. And then we have Hong Kong, so that's Hong Kong, okay? Uh, so yeah, those are uh, the uh, regions. And then if we just hop over here to the regional table, this gives you an idea um, what services are offered. So when we said that not all services are available, you can kind of see that like, for example, that Amazon Connect is only available in a few regions. So we have North Virginia and North uh, Carolina. Okay, and then Deep Lens really is only in uh, Northern Virginia. So again, what, as I said, everything is in North, Northern Virginia. You can see we have checkboxes all the way down here. And this is also bro uh, broken up based on um, those geographical uh, continents. So if I go here, you can see um, Ireland seems to be uh, having all the ones in uh, Europe. And then in Asia Pacific, it looks like, um, I guess, Singapore. Singapore looks like they have uh, the majority of services there. Okay, so there you go. That is... Uh,
Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at availability zones, also known as AZs. So an AZ is a data center owned and operated by AWS in which AWS services run. Each uh, region has at least two AZs, and AWS is getting pretty close to being able to say that they have at least three AZs in all regions. AZs are represented by a region code followed by a letter identifier. So US East 1 is the region, that would be North Virginia, and A is the data center, okay? And so uh, from uh, North Virginia, there are six um, AZs, so you'd have A, B, C, D, E, F, okay? Then uh, we want to just talk on the concept of multi-AZ. So this is when you're distributing your instances across multiple availability zones, which allows for failover configuration for handling requests when one AZ goes down, okay? So uh, that is very useful. And then uh, one more thing we want to note is that uh, the latency between availability zones is sub 10 milliseconds, okay? So uh, these AZs are purposely um, uh, positioned to be exactly that far apart, okay? Um, and so there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at edge locations, and this is all about getting data fast or uploading data fast to AWS. So an edge location is a data center owned by a trusted partner of AWS, which has a direct connection to the AWS network. These locations serve requests for CloudFront and Route 53, and requests going to either of these services will be routed to the nearest edge location automatically. Um, so uh, we also have S3 transfer acceleration and API a gateway. And the idea here is that um, this is where you want to upload data quickly uh, to AWS. Uh, you're going to use these two services to uh, hit a special endpoint um, edge, uh, at an edge location to then uh, transfer stuff uh, quickly via the AWS network, okay? So uh, the whole uh, takeaway from this is that edge locations allow for low latency no matter where the end user is geographically located. All right, so we're back on the AWS website here where we were looking at regions earlier, but this time I want to give um, attention to uh, edge locations. So edge locations are the little blue dots here, and you can see there are a lot of them, okay? And so down below, we have um, an idea of how many edge locations there are. Uh, and you can see that there are, are a lot. So even just in Atlanta alone, there are five. Um, and so th they uh, definitely uh, outnumber availability zones, okay? So just to give you an idea, those are the ones for um, North America. Then down below, uh, we have uh, just a few there, okay, uh, for Brazil. Uh, then in uh, Europe, we have quite a few here. Uh, and then in Asia Pacific, uh, we have uh, more edge locations. So there you go, uh, that's edge locations. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we're going to take a look at GovCloud, okay? And so GovCloud is a, a very special region uh, that allows customers to host sensitive, controlled, unclassified information and other types of regulated workloads. So the GovCloud region is only operated by employees who are U.S. citizens and U.S. or on U.S. soil. So it's definitely not something that I can use uh, because you have to be a U.S. identity uh, uh, and root account holders who pass a screening process in order to use this particular region. So who is this uh, very special region for? It's for customers uh, that need to architect secure cloud solutions that comply with FedRAMP, uh, the Department of Justice, the U.S. International Traffic and Arms Regulation, Export Administration Regulations, and the Department of Defense, okay? So um, it just makes it a lot easier um, if you are working in the U.S. with these uh, government bodies uh, in order to utilize cloud computing, okay? So I just hopped back over here on the AWS uh, Global Infrastructure Regions page because I just wanted to uh, highlight here uh, those uh, GovCloud region. So there actually are two. There is one on US West and US East. Uh, as far as I'm aware of, there aren't any other GovClouds other than for US at this time. Maybe in the future AWS will have it for other countries, but um, for the time being, it's just the US. And just to look at the GovCloud page here in more uh, detail here, uh, you can see all the nice uh, graphics here for that address security and compliance. So if you want to uh, build something and sell it to the uh, government or gov government related industries by using GovCloud, you are going to uh, become compliant. OK, and that's going to make uh, business a lot easier for you. So, yeah, that's all you need to know. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and I'm gonna show you how to get set up with your AWS account. 
so here I am on the uh, AWS homepage and we have two buttons that we can click on. We can click the one here in the middle or click the big orange button to create our account. I like to press the orange one, so that's what I'm gonna go ahead and do here, okay? Okay, great, and so uh, now we're gonna be presented with a form here, so I'm gonna go ahead here and just uh, fill in an email. So I'm gonna do Andrew F, uh, plus fresh at exampro.co since this is a, a fresh account, okay? And I'm just going to supply some kind of password here. I'm going to call this the ExamPro a fresh account. Okay. And I'm just going to go ahead here and continue. So uh, now in order to uh, create uh, this account, uh, we're going to have to provide some additional information here. So I'm just going to mark this as a personal and I'm going to uh, fill in this information here. Um, okay. And so I'm just going to have to go here and fill that in. Okay, okay, so now I have that information filled in there. And so I'm just going to have to uh, check here to say that I agree to their customer agreement. Okay, and we can go ahead and create our account. Now, in order to use AWS, you have to have a valid credit card. You cannot uh, use AWS without a credit card. Okay, so um, that's just something that you're going to have to do. Um, so I'm going to just go ahead here and provide my uh, credit card here. Okay. All right, so now I have all my information filled in here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and verify and add. Okay, and then now it just wants to also uh, verify uh, my phone number. This is definitely something that's required. So I'm just going to provide my phone number here. Okay, great, my phone number is in there. I'm just going to supply the security check here. So we'll just fill that in. Okay, and then we will just send an SMS and confirm. Great, so that uh, text message came in here. So I'm just going to uh, fill in the confirmation here, 0448, okay. And great, so now we're verified. Okay, so now we are going to choose our support plan. Uh, we're definitely gonna go with the basic here. Great, and so now we just have a little bit of information here. Um, I don't really need to do any of this. I'm just ready to go sign into the console. Great, so now uh, that we've created our account, I believe we could probably go ahead and sign up here. I'm not sure if we have to confirm our email because we did confirm by phone number, but let's just give it a go here and see if we can log in, okay? So we'll just put that in there. We'll just provide the password. Great, so we have uh, made it into uh, this AWS account here. So this new account is uh, realized. So there you go. Um, and maybe we'll just have to poke around here to see if there's anything else we need to do. Uh, but yeah, we're in good shape. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and what we're going to do uh, now is make sure you do not get overbilled. And there are three ways we're going to do that. So there are some billing preferences we're going to set. We're going to set up um, a budget in AWS budgets, and we're also going to create a billing alarm. Okay, I'm just going to talk you also through as to like the advantages and disadvantages of some of these things, and also just make sure we do not get overbilled within our account. So the first thing uh, I want you to do is I want you to make your way over to support, um, or sorry, uh, maybe under your account here. You're going to go to uh, my billing dashboard. And when you uh, get over here, I want you to click on the left hand side here and go to billing preferences. Okay. And so we're going to have a bunch of preferences here and they're all really good. So the first one is receive a PDF invoice by email. I would check that on receive free tier usage alerts. This is definitely important because if you have a free account, you want to know when you are going outside that free tier. Uh, and so then you just uh, provide your email there. So I'm just going to do Andrew plus fresh at exam pro uh, co there. Uh, and then we have received billing alerts. Okay. And you definitely want to uh, turn that on. Uh, and there is this detailed billing reports down here. Um, this is a legacy feature. Uh, this has now been replaced with cost and usage reports. Okay. So it's not necessary to uh, turn that on. Um, and I uh, actually do uh, show you how to use um, uh, cost and usage uh, somewhere in this course here. So uh, we will cover that. But anyway, make sure these are all three ticked on. Provide your email and save your preferences, okay? And now you're gonna be in the loop of um, some of your billing information, okay? So now that we have uh, these preferences set up, 
Um, let's make our way over to Adibus Budgets. So I want you to go to the top here and we're going to type in Budgets. Okay. And so what budgets uh, do is they allow you to tell you whether you are getting over or whether uh, you are going over your defined budget or it's going to also provide some forecast cost to you as well. Okay, so now that AWS budgets here has loaded, what I want you to do is create a new budget. You get two free budgets um, in AWS. So we can definitely set uh, two there. Um, it's two cents per day uh, for uh, um, budgets. And so that doesn't sound like a lot, but um, if you made your third budget, it's gonna cost you $14 per month, okay? So for uh, more additional ways of tracking um, uh, costs, we're gonna use billing lines, which um, really are inexpensive or and or free, but we'll do budgets first because it's good to at least have one budget set here for all costs. So here I'm just gonna say um, overall costs, okay? All right, uh, and we will leave it uh, monthly here. I can't remember if overall is one or two L's. I think it's two. Uh, if we want this to be a reoccurring budget. We're gonna have a fixed cost and we're gonna set it some, something very low such as $20, okay? Since we are using, again, the free tier, uh, we should not be expecting to uh, see a bill for quite a while and $20 is a, uh, a good low bill there. Uh, and we definitely want um, all costs unblended. So this is great and everything is checkbox there. So we'll go ahead here and configure alerts. And we're going to provide our email again. So I'm going to do Andrew plus fresh at exampro.co. Okay. Uh, and we'll just hit add there. It's already been added. You could also use SNS, but we're going to leave that alone. Uh, and we can also get alerted when we are approaching it. So we haven't surpassed uh, 100%. But actually, I'm just going to set it to 100 because $20 to me is not a lot. And we can do this for actual or forecasted. I'm going to leave that for actual. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead there and create that budget. All right. And so we don't have any information here, but if I just give it a hard refresh. So if you are, if you are using an account where you're doing stuff, if you do refresh there, you'll probably see more information. Okay, great. And so we've created a budget. So now that we have our uh, budget created there, uh, let's go make a billing alarm for a higher amount. Okay. So what, what I want you to do is go to services and type in CloudWatch. Okay. And uh, once we are over here, we are going to make our way over to alarms. All right. And so we're going to make our way over to a billing here. And what it's going to tell us is that we need to switch regions because billing metrics always live in US East 1. Okay. So generally, it's always good to uh, switch to that region there. So what we'll do is we'll go up to the top here and switch to US East 1. Okay. And so now if we go to billing, we can now set our uh, billing alarm, okay? So uh, notice down here that we get 10 free alarms uh, and 1,000 free email notifications. So uh, it's definitely uh, uh, more free than budgets, okay? But budgets it, uh, does have a lot more functionality uh, there, but uh, you can use definitely use both, okay? So here I'm creating a, a new um, a billing alarm and I'm just gonna scroll down here and we can set the amount. So here I'm just gonna set a larger amount such as $100. And so if it's greater or equal to that, um, then it is going to alert me. Okay, and we'll leave CAD and estimated charges there alone. We'll look at some additional configuration. This is all good, we'll hit next, okay. Um, and then the next thing is uh, we need it to uh, actually notify us. So we're gonna say add notification here. And oh, I think I already had one here, so it's not necessary, but we needed to send it to something. So it's going to need an SNS topic. We don't have one, so we'll create a new one. Okay, and we can call this um, notify me. Okay, and then I'll just provide my email there again. Okay, and we'll hit create topic. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and hit next. And we'll just say, um, so this $100, 100, bill, uh, 100 uh, billing alarm. I don't know if it'll let you do spaces there. So I'm just out of habit. I always leave out spaces. Great. And so we're just previewing it here. So we'll just scroll down. This all looks good. And so now we have a billing alarm. So, uh, you know, it's not uncommon to create multiple billing alarms. So you could have one at 100 and then 150 and 200 just so you can keep track of that stuff and of course uh, you definitely want to make use of AWS budgets so you have two there that you can utilize so maybe once you start using your account and you use the live vc2 instances and you just want to monitor that you create a budget for that but yeah we have all bases covered here um, and the only thing that is left to do is we need to confirm 
this uh, the email that was sent out to us so that our billing alarm, uh, it will take effect, okay? All right, so um, that notification was sent to me um, for the billing alarm there for notify me. So it's just me subscribing to that uh, SNS topic. I guess we only have to do this once and I think we add additional ones we won't have to confirm. Uh, but I'm just gonna go ahead here and hit uh, confirmation, okay? And so uh, now that is confirmed there, okay? And uh, I think if I do a refresh here, it should say that this is now a different state. Okay, so it just has nothing there, which is good. Uh, so yeah, we are all set up and uh, we don't have to worry about getting overbuilt. All right, so there's a little bit more work we need to do to have our account fully set up uh, so we can start working in with AWS. And what I want you to do is make your way over to IAM. So just go up here and type in IAM. If you click that there, you'll end up uh, in the same place that I am here. And so we have a bunch of recommendations here uh, that AWS wants us to do. So we need to turn MFA on our root account. We need to create individual users because we generally do not want to be using the root account, which is what we're logged in as right now. Um, and we'll have to set some groups um, and assign permissions and apply an IAM password policy. So let's go ahead and do that. But just before we do, uh, I just wanna make it easier for us to sign in. Uh, so what we can do here is change this URL. So just go ahead here and customize and we're just gonna say Xampro Fresh, okay? Uh, and that is a unique name. So if you type in something and it says it's not, or it's taken, you'll just have to change it until you get something uh, that you like. So now that we have that set up, let's go uh, turn on MFA. So we're going to want to turn on MFA for this account, um, specifically the root account here. Uh, and the reason why is that let's say someone stole your email and password to this uh, root account, uh, then they would be able to do some serious damage. So by turning on MFA, uh, there's going to be an additional layer of security. So the idea is uh, when somebody logs in, they're going to have to provide an additional code based on the MFA uh, delivery mechanism. So just let's go here and hit manage MFA. Uh, okay, and so it's going to pop up here and just say what we're already doing, which is um, to uh, start securing our account. And so I'm just going to click off there, go to MFA and activate MFA. And so now we're gonna be presented with three options. We have virtual U uh, uh, UTF and other hardware. So virtual is gonna be for mobile devices. That's what we're gonna do. So we're just gonna go ahead there and hit continue. Okay, and what we wanna do is we want to install a compatible application on our phone. So just going over here, if we scroll down, it's going to uh, tell us which ones are compatible. Uh, I definitely know Authenticator is one. So I'm just going to search for that there. Um, where are you? Yeah, down here. So if you're on Android or iPhone, you have uh, Authy2 or Google Authenticator. I'm using Google Authenticator. I find that more easy to use. And then the idea here is you'll just hit show QR code. And then uh, using, uh, once you have Authenticator installed, you're going to open up the Authenticator app. I know you can't see me doing this, so I'll just have to talk my way through it here. And uh, there's a plus button in Google Authenticator and it says scan a barcode. And so now I'm holding my uh, my uh, um, phone up to the computer there. It's grabbed the code and it's saved the secret. So now what I need to do is enter in two consecutive codes. So going down here, um, I'm gonna enter this code in before it expires. So this one is 786763. And then there's a little wheel that is spinning and it's going to then uh, give us a new set of numbers. Okay, and so now it is now um, 984. 816. And so I'm just going to hit assign MFA there. And now it uh, MFA is turned on. So now that we have MFA turned on, we can make our way back to our dashboard and proceed to the next step. So now we're going to proceed to create ourselves our own user because again, we do not want to be using the root account. This should be a rarely used and we should just create ourselves a user. So we'll hit manage users here. We're going to hit add user. And I'm gonna create a new one called Andrew Brown. We're gonna give it programmatic access and access to the console. We're gonna let it auto generate a password for us. And we're going to make sure that it requires a password reset the next time this user logs in. Going to permissions, we don't have any groups. So we're gonna create a group here. And we're gonna call this group an admin or admins, I should say. And we're gonna give it administrator access. Now, 
Um, generally, you don't want to be giving too many users uh, admin access because this gives you full access, just like a root account. Uh, but for uh, our purposes here, this is totally fine. It's not unusual to have one or two admins within your entire account, but generally you want to set most people as power user, okay? And uh, this is, a, uh, it gives you full access, but there are uh, some uh, limitations such as you don't have the ability to manage users and groups. So um, power user is a very good one here, but for uh, this one here, we are going to stick with admin. I'm gonna hit create group. And we are gonna go ahead and hit next and review. And we will hit create user. And so now what it will do is we're gonna get an access key ID, a secret and a password. So I'm just gonna expose those here. And uh, I'm just gonna copy these off screen. All right, and then we will just proceed uh, here. Okay, so I just copied um, at least my password off screen here. And what I'm gonna do next is I'm going to make my way uh, back to the IAM console. So we'll just go up here, services, and we can just type in IAM. Okay, and so uh, now we um, have done pretty much everything uh, here except for setting a password policy. So um, just before we go ahead and set a password policy, what I want to do is I want to uh, log into this new user. So we have this nice long URL here. So I want you to copy that URL. And what we're gonna do is we're going to log out and now log in as um, uh, that new uh, user, okay? So I'll just go ahead here and log out. Great, so I'm logged out here. And so the way we can get to that page is we can paste in that URL up here, which will uh, bring us to the console. And so you can you can always use that link, or if you can remember that alias, you could always just go to the console and type it in there. And so my name was Andrew Brown here. I'm just gonna go off screen and grab my password. And I'm just gonna hit sign in here. All right, and so now I just need to reset my password here. So I'm gonna provide the old password and we are going to set a new password. Great, and so now I'm logged in, um, not as the root user, but as uh, a new user I've created. And uh, just one more thing here, I want to go uh, back to IAM here. And the reason I wanna go back here is that I exposed my um, access key and password to you. And anytime that actually happens, what you're gonna wanna do is go to your user there. Uh, and I'm gonna go to Andrew Brown here, and we're gonna go to uh, our security credentials. And you can see that was that access key and you uh, saw that password. So what I can do is I can make it inactive and then I can create myself another access key. And I'm not gonna show you the secret this time around, but it's just, um, uh, you know, anytime you uh, accidentally share your credentials, you're definitely going to uh, want to reset them there. And uh, the password that you saw earlier, it doesn't matter because I reset my password when I logged in here, okay? So now that that is all set up, um, uh, what we will do is we will log out of this account and we will log back in as the root account to set up a password policy. Okay, and I just want to show you when I go to sign into the console, it's going to show me um, this filled in. And so whenever we're logging in as the root account, we actually have to click this link down below. Um, and so uh, we would just type in our email here but if I wanted to log back in as that user, I could just type in here exam pro fresh and it would bring me back to here and I would fill in this information. But if you're always logging in as the root user, I'm just gonna click back there. It's always your email. I know that's a little bit confusing, but that's just how it works. And so this time around, I got the MFA, so I can't just log in willy nilly. So I'm just gonna use my phone and I'm going to open up Authenticator and I have to provide it that code, okay? So it's those numbers again. So this one's gonna be 904361. I'm gonna hit submit. And so now I'm back into my account and we'll make our way back to IAM and, and do that last step there. And so we just have one more thing that AWS wants us to do and let's apply an IAM password policy. So we'll go down here and click manage password policy. And so what we can see is a bunch of stuff and we really just care about this part up here. So I'll set password policy. And now we can see some rules so you can enforce the minimum characters. You can re require at least one uppercase, one lowercase, uh, at least one number, require at least one of these, enable password expiration, um, yeah, I could do that, I suppose. Uh, password expiration requires admin reset, maybe not. 
allow users to change their own password, definitely uh, prevent password reuse. So ensure they don't use the same password. I would probably just crank this up as high as possible. We'll leave it as five and we'll save changes. And so now um, if we go back to our dashboard, we should satisfy that entire list. And so we have, so uh, we've met every requirement of AWS. So generally uh, from now on, you should just log in as that user and stay out of your root account, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. And now that we've set up our account, I want to go through the motions of using uh, some of the most common AWS services with you here so you can gain some confidence uh, here on the uh, platform itself. Uh, and just to have some uh, practical hands-on experience, this is not gonna be a very difficult section. It's not important for you to remember anything, uh, but just to, again, gain confidence. And just before we get started here, I want to uh, make sure that you are in the North Virginia region, okay? So North Virginia, also known as US East One. Uh, the reason why it's one is because there's another US East, which is US East Two. This one is US East One because it came first. But based on the region you're in is going to change the uh, the offerings that you have because not everything is available in every single region. Generally, they are across all regions. But like uh, if I was in Canada Central, uh, we have fewer uh, availability zones. Those are data centers where in North Virginia, we have like six. Uh, and if there are any new features, they're definitely going to be in North Virginia. Uh, so I'm just going to ask you to change over to that region and follow along with me there. Okay. So the first thing I want you to do is I'm going to show you how to launch a server. So a server is going to be using EC2. So going up to services here, we will type in EC2 and we'll make our way over to the EC2 console. So once we are here, I want you to go ahead and launch a new instance. So there's a big blue button here. So we'll just hit launch instance. And uh, now we're going to be presented with a bunch of options to configure our server. So we are going to choose what OS we want to use. We're going to sp uh, stick with Amazon Linux 2 because it's part of the free tier and saving money is a great thing when we are learning. The next thing we need to do is choose the size of our uh, of our uh, server here. So these are called instance types. And so uh, you can see that the memory gets larger and the amount of CPUs get larger. We're going to stick with T2 Micro because, again, that's part of the free tier and we want to save some money. Going next to instance details, we can choose how many instances we want to uh, start. An instance is a server. So if you uh, have uh, 10 instances, that's 10 servers. And we have a lot of options here. We're going to launch it in our default VPC and into the default subnet. Uh, it is going to be auto assigned a public IP. So it's going to be uh, public facing. And uh, we're going to want to create an IM role here. So what I want you to do is go ahead and uh, uh, just right click here and make a new tab because uh, we want to give this uh, a bit of permissions. So up here, I'm just gonna go to uh, the IM management console. And I want you to make your way down and create a new role. And so we are going to be presented with a bunch of options. So we are uh, creating a role for EC2. So we'll select EC2. We're going to go to next to permissions. And I want you to type in SSM. Uh, and I want you to choose Amazon EC2 role for SSM. SSM is Simple Systems Manager. And that's going to be a way for us to actually uh, log into that machine. Okay. And so we're going to get here and I'm just going to say my EC2 uh, role and I want you to hit create role. And so now that role has been created and uh, we will just go ahead and close that tab there and we will drop this down. You're going to see that it says none. So we'll hit the refresh button here and we'll choose my EC2 role. So now we have uh, that, uh, uh, that set up. Uh, we are going to leave everything else blank and I want you to go to storage. So here you can choose how, how much storage you want. It's going to have eight gigabytes by default. You can change the volume type. We're going to stick with general purpose. Uh, and we are going to go review and launch. And we are going to hit launch. And it's going to ask you to uh, create a key pair. Um, and so key pairs are used to get into the server. Um, but we actually don't need one because we are using SSM, which is another way of logging into the server. So we're going to proceed without a key pair. Okay, and we'll just set, I acknowledge that. I will not be able to connect to this instance unless I already know the, the built-in password, which is not true because we can get through Systems Manager, but we will go ahead and launch this instance. All right, and so this instance is now launching. In order for us to uh, see it, you can either go view instances. We'll just click that down below here. 
All right, and so now this instance is launching and uh, you're gonna see it in a pending state and we're waiting for uh, two status checks to pass. So this is gonna turn from yellow to green and then we're gonna uh, wait for this to initialize. Uh, and uh, once that's done here, I'll see you here in a moment. Go. Okay, so after a short wait here, I think I waited about three to four minutes. Um, our server uh, is now running and it also has uh, two checks so that means that the uh, server is in good shape. So now that our server is running, we're just gonna take a peek down here because we get a variety of different information such as when it was launched, the IM role, uh, the security group that it is in, which was the default one, what size it was, and we can see that it has a public IP address and private IP addresses. Okay, so now that the server is running, this is uh, costing us money. Now we are on the free tier, so I guess technically it's not. But if we wanted to shut this down, and we're not going to shut it down just yet, but I'm just showing here that we would just go here to terminate, and that would shut the server down, uh, uh, and then we would no longer be paying for it. We could also stop the instance, and that wouldn't destroy it, but it would not have it not run anymore, and we'd also be saving money, okay? So whether you stop or terminate that instance uh, will ensure that you save money. So uh, now that uh, this is done, let's actually learn how to uh, uh, get access to this instance. All right, so there's a couple different ways we can get into this instance. Uh, one way is using SSH. Uh, so if we had created that key pair, we could have used it to uh, get into that uh, server here, or we can use simple systems manager, sessions manager, which is the my preferred way, and AWS, AWS's recommended way, which is what we're going to do. But just before we go ahead over to SSM, I want you to right click here and just uh, go to connect. And you can see that it's actually giving you instructions. So if you had downloaded that key pair, you would have had to mod it, you would have had to do um, a bunch of other stuff. So you'd have to use SSH and provide that key to get into it. So there are instructions there. There's also this EC2 instance connect. Uh, and so this is another way uh, to connect. I'm not sure if it would let us in here without our, um, our, our key pair, but I'll just give it a go here. And it did. So this is one way. This is actually, I guess, the third way to access it. Um, so actually, I'm in the server right now. But the way I want to show you how to get in is uh, via Simple Systems Manager. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead there and close that. I want you to go to the top here and type in SSM, which is for Simple Systems Manager. Even though they never display the simple word uh, there anymore, it definitely is part of the name. And then once we are over here, I want you to go to the left-hand side and go to Session Manager. And we're going to start a session. And uh, so we can see we have our instance. So remember when we created that IM role and we set it with um, that SSM EC2 role? That was so that we could use Sessions Manager. And the advantage here of using Sessions Manager, it's going to um, uh, log every time somebody uses a session. So I just hit start on that session there. And so it's very similar to that other connect screen here. And it actually logs in as the root user, not the EC2 user, which is a bit frustrating. So we'd have to do sudo su. Um, EC2 hyphen user, and now we are the correct user and we are within this instance. So, uh, you know, that's how you gain access to it. Uh, we're not really gonna be doing much with this instance uh, today. So I want you to go ahead and terminate this instance, or sorry, that session there. But uh, that session history is recorded. So by forcing everyone to use Sessions Manager, you're gonna have um, uh, a bit more um, uh, visibility over what's going on with these machines. Uh, whereas SSH, uh, might not provide that same visibility without you manually uh, putting that effort in there, okay? Uh, but we'll make our way back to the EC2 console here. Uh, so just type in EC2 here again. And uh, once we are here, uh, I want you to go on the left-hand side to instances. And so here we uh, can see our server. So uh, we now know how to uh, get into this machine. And I would say that uh, we probably want to go ahead and uh, stop this instance here. So I want you to go ahead and just stop it, okay? And that way uh, it's not gonna cost us anything. Um, and now we can do our next step, which is to create an AMI. All right, so now we're gonna learn how to create an AMI. And you can think of an AMI as like a snapshot or um, like saving a copy of your entire server. So what you're gonna do is go up to the, uh, uh, make sure the instance is selected there, go to actions. We're gonna go to uh, image here and create an image. Now we could create an image whether this is stopped or running. If it was terminated, uh, the server wouldn't exist anymore. So there would be nothing to create an image of. But we'll go ahead here and create an image. 
And we are going to have to provide it some uh, information. So I'm just going to call this fresh um, hyphen zero, zero, zero. Okay. Uh, and then you can see that it has an instance volume. And so that is the um, hard drive that's attached there. And we're just going to leave it as the default settings and create an image. And so now it's creating the image and it's view pending image creation. So we'll click on this blue link here. And we'll just wait until that is created. Now it doesn't take too long. But the idea here is now once we have an AMI, if we wanted to launch another uh, uh, a copy of this uh, the server, we were just going to have to hit launch here. Okay. But the real reason I wanted to, to set up this AMI was because we are going to uh, next set up an auto scaling group and we're going to need an AMI to do that. Okay. So I'll just see you here in a little bit once this is uh, done. And I just wanted to show you here that it is done, all right? And so now if we wanted to launch a version of the server, we could hit launch and it's going to uh, go to the second step. So if we go back here, you can actually see that it chose uh, fresh 000. So if we were to proceed through this, it's a, a way for us to upgrade our server or make other changes to it, or just so that we have um, a copy of it so we can uh, launch multiple servers. And just to get back to the AMI there, I'm just gonna click on the left-hand side here. But yeah, that's all we need to know for AMI and we'll move on to auto scaling groups. All right, so now that we've created an AMI, we are ready to make an auto scaling group. So down below, I want you to go to auto scaling groups. And so what an auto scaling group does is it allows you to um, ensure that uh, multiple instances or servers are, are running. So if you always wanted to guarantee that one server is running, an auto scaling group would have a rule that would check to say, is at least one running? And if not, then launch a new server. Um, also, auto scaling groups are used to meet the demand of whatever traffic you have. So let's say you have a web application or a website and it's getting a lot of traffic and it's going to need more servers. Well, auto scaling groups will uh, uh, determine based on certain metrics uh, that um, the uh, the web application needs more servers and it will spin up more servers. And when the, uh, the demand of traffic becomes lower, then it's going to remove servers to meet the demand, okay? So what we'll go ahead and, and do here is create a new auto scaling group. Um, and, oh, they just changed this on me. Uh, so I'm a little bit confused, but we'll just hit getting started. I think that's just a bit of a a uh, thing there, and then we're going to choose our AMI. So this is very uh, similar to launching EC2 instance, but we already have our own AMI. So I'm going to go to my AMIs. I'm just going to select that fresh one there, and we're going to stick with T2 Micro. We'll go next. Uh, we're going to have to name it uh, this launch configuration. So we'll just name this uh, Fresh LC. Um, we're are going to use the my EC2 role there. Uh, we're going to go ahead and add storage. Uh, the defaults look great there. Um, the security groups look great there. And we are going to create launch configuration and we are going to drop that down and proceed without a key pair because we don't need one. And we're going to create that launch configuration. So now that we've created the launch configuration, we can go ahead and create the auto scaling group. So we're going to call this one uh, Fresh ASG. ASG is for auto scaling group. Uh, we're going to set the group size to one. So the number of instances the group should have at any time. So at minimum, how many servers should be running. Uh, then we have to have a, uh, a, a network or a VPC. Uh, and we need to choose some subnets. So we're are gonna choose one and then we're gonna choose a, another one here. Okay, we just need a couple there. I'm just gonna check advanced details. This all looks great. We're gonna configure our scaling policies. Scaling policies are ways, uh, rules that you can use to um, uh, determine uh, how um, uh, the auto scaling group should react to changes within um, its environment, right? So if you have a lot of CPU utilization, maybe that's when it spins up servers. Maybe it's only when there's a lot of uh, data transfer in or when there's a lot of memory. So that's what scaling policies allow you to do. Uh, then we'll go to notifications, uh, and then we'll go to tags, uh, and then we will review, and we'll go ahead and create that auto scaling group, okay? So it says that auto scaling group has been created. We'll hit close. And here we can see our fresh, fresh ASG, and it's using our launch configuration, which is our fresh LC. Currently, there are zero instances running. Uh, the desired capacity is one. The minimum servers that should be running is one. The maximum servers that should be running is one, okay? So if we just move this up here and go to instances, um, it should st uh, try to start spinning up servers to meet the minimum demand, which is one. So I'm gonna hit a refresh here. And I'm just kind of expecting to see a server uh, starting here. If we're not seeing one here just yet, what I want you to do is right click here on um, instances and go here and I bet you a server is starting up. 
So I don't see any uh, servers running here as of yet. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna hit refresh here because usually they would just uh, start spinning up here. But yeah, we'll just give this here a, a little moment here because maybe it's just uh, taking some time to get started. So yeah, we just had to wait even just a minute there and uh, I just hit refresh and already we can see that this is now one and under our instances, um, it is launching a new instance ID. Um, so, or sorry, an instance, that's just the ID of the instance. So if we go back to our instance tab and we just do a refresh here, we can see another instance is spinning up, okay? So uh, what we're gonna do is we're going to just wait for that instance to start. Um, and uh, once, once it does, we'll move on to the next step. All right, so after waiting a few minutes here, our instance is now started here. I'm just gonna select this one off here, but this is the instance here that is running. That's part of our auto scaling group. So again, we said that auto scaling groups, uh, they can ensure that there's always at least a minimum of servers running. Uh, and so if we were to terminate this instance, so I'm just going to go ahead and terminate it. Uh, what's gonna happen is once it shuts down, we're gonna go back to our auto scaling group. It's going to detect that this one is no longer healthy. Okay, so see over here that it says healthy right now, but uh, it will, after a while, determine that it is unhealthy. And then what it will do as a response, it's going to launch a new instance. So we're just gonna wait here uh, for a little bit until this is now flagged unhealthy, okay? All right, and so we can now see that um, this instance is unhealthy. And so the way um, this auto scaling group is going to respond is by launching a new instance. So now we're just gonna wait here a little bit and just keep on hitting this refresh button until um, uh, we see another instance spinning up to replace this unhealthy one. Okay, so I just hit the um, refresh here and so that unhealthy instance is gone. And so I guess what we're just going to uh, wait for here is now a healthy instance to uh, replace uh, that unhealthy one. So just to get back to that, uh, that minimum of one server running, okay? So we'll just go ahead here and just refresh. And so there we go. So we can see that we have a new uh, server that is starting up. So we'll just wait until that one is totally uh, set up here. And uh, we've now accomplished uh, what we wanted with auto scaling groups and we will just destroy this auto scaling group. All right, so our replacement instance is now uh, healthy and in service. So what I want to do is go ahead and remove this auto scaling group. Now I believe that when we delete this auto scaling group, it's going to take down the instance as well. So we're not gonna to have to uh, delete that. So I'm just gonna go ahead here and delete the auto scaling group and we're gonna say a yes. Okay, and so uh, we are going to uh, just watch that delete there and hit uh, refresh there. And also since we have that instance tab open, uh, we'll hit refresh here. And so we have that instance running. So what we're hoping to see is that this instance is torn down when uh, we uh, have uh, deleted this um, auto scaling group. So we'll just wait here a little bit and see what happens. All right, and so um, if we uh, were to do a few refreshes there, it indeed is shutting down uh, that instance that was spun up by the auto scaling group. So when you delete your auto scaling group, it's going to uh, take down those instances as well. So, uh, you know, that's an, uh, it for the auto scaling group section and we can move on to Elastic Load Balancer. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are going to learn about Elastic Load Balancers, also known as ELBs. And what they do is they allow you to put a load balancer uh, in front of your instances. And the idea is that when traffic comes uh, into your web application, it's gonna flow, flow through the uh, load balancer and it's going to evenly distribute uh, that traffic to multiple instances. Uh, and your instances generally will be running in different availability zones. So if one AZ uh, becomes unavailable, then your traffic will then go to the other AZ where you have an instance running. So you do not experience a downtime uh, uh, and your uh, web application remains running, okay? So now that we have an idea what ELBs are, let's go ahead and launch a few instances so that uh, we have something to load balance to. And so I'm gonna choose Amazon Linux 2 here. We are going to stick with the T2 Micro because it is free. I want you to select two instances here, okay? And uh, we're gonna leave all the settings alone. Maybe we'll give IM role. We do not need to SSH into, or sorry, use SSM to get into that instance but uh, it doesn't hurt to attach it there. We're gonna leave storage alone. We're gonna go past tags. We're gonna go to our security groups. I'm gonna set it to an existing one and use the default one. Every time you create a, um, uh, an instance, it seems like it really encourages you to keep making new uh, security groups. We don't need to have a bunch of these, so we will just go and use the existing one. 
and I'm going to uh, review and then launch. And I'm going to drop down here and proceed without a key pair because we don't need a key pair. Uh, and so now these instances are going to uh, uh, start up here and I'm just going to wait until they get into um, a running state with two status checks and we'll go ahead and create our ELB. All right, so our two uh, instances are ready here and I just want to go ahead and give them a name. So I'm going to just call this one instance A and then we will call this one instance uh, B, okay? And uh, now that I have those two instances, let's go uh, make our way over to um, uh, load balancing here. It's under the EC2 console. And so we will click here. And what we will do is we will create ourselves a new load balancer. Now there are three types of load balancers. We have application load balancer, uh, network load balancer, and classic load balancer. We are gonna be using application load balancer here. And that's generally what you're gonna be wanting to use. We are gonna type in ALB uh, or maybe my ALB here. Uh, it will be internet facing, okay? Um, we need to ensure that it's running in at least two availability zones or it's going to complain to us. Uh, uh, so we will go ahead and do that. Uh, we will go to the next step here. We aren't using uh, SSL or HTTPS, so uh, we don't have to do anything here. Um, for security groups, we will use the existing security group, the default one, so that's totally fine. And uh, for configuring routing, we're going to have to create a new target group. A target group um, contains refer or, uh, a reference to the instances which we want to route traffic to. Uh, so uh, we are just going to make a new one. I'm going to just say my target group here. And uh, we can route things to uh, different things. So it could be instances or specific IPs or lambdas. So we're going to stick with instances. And we're gonna go ahead here and register uh, those targets. So here we can see we have instances here. I'm just gonna select them and add to register. So now they are registered up here. We're gonna hit next. Um, and then we are gonna go ahead and create, okay? And so it takes very little time uh, for a load balancer to create. We will then uh, hit close here. And uh, this load balancer is now just provisioning. So we're just gonna wait here a little while until this is uh, provisioned. And you just have to hit the refresh here um, and uh, see when this is ready. All right, so um, our load balancer is ready. It didn't really take that long. It took about a minute or so. Uh, and so just to poke around here, um, you can see that uh, this load balancer here has a DNS name, okay? So this uh, DNS name, just looks like a domain name. And the way you would um, route your traffic to the Elastic Load Balancer is you'd actually point it to here, okay? And so uh, all the traffic would go here and then it would then uh, go on to the listeners. And the, the listeners listen on a particular port. So this is port 80. Uh, and then uh, it's going to then have rules, which is going to um, forward this traffic to that target group. If we click into this target group here, all right. Uh, what it's going to do is it's going to show us um, the actual targets. So if we go over here and look at targets, it's going to then route it to the registered targets. So that's how an elastic load balancer works. Um, and that's all we really need to know uh, for this, but just to show you how to make an el uh, elastic load balancer. So now that we're done here, let's go tear this stuff down. So we'll go ahead here and we will just go delete this load balancer. Now, unlike the auto scaling group, which would actually tear down the instances, we have to take these instances down ourselves. And so what I want you to do is select A and B here, and we are just going to uh, terminate these here. Okay, and that is our Elastic Load Balancer section. All right, so we're gonna learn a little bit about S3 here. So what I want you to do is go up to services here and type in S3, uh, and we will go make our way over to um, the S3 console here. And so the first thing I want you to notice that uh, when you come to S3, that it is uh, global here. So S3 does not require a region selection. However, the buckets that we're going to create will be region specific. Uh, and the idea here is a bucket is just a place to contain uh, your uh, uh, files, okay? So we will just create a bucket here and we're gonna give it a name. So I'm gonna call this exam pro fresh. Now these names are gl uh, globally unique. It's just like selecting a domain name. So if the name you have here selected is not um, available, you'll just have to change the name and we have the option to choose, choose the region. So I'm gonna go ahead here and create this bucket. So now I have a bucket and we can start uploading files to this bucket. So uh, I'll go ahead here and just hit upload. And uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna add some files. And so for my desktop, I have a photo of me. I'm gonna hit open here. I'm gonna upload uh, that there. 
And so now we have a um, a file here in S3, okay? And so if I wanna download it, I can just hit that uh, download button there uh, and that will allow us, us to download that file. And there's a variety of different things that you can uh, do in S3, but that is just uh, the most basic uh, things you need to know. Um, about S3, okay? But we aren't gonna delete this bucket because we're going to use it in combination with um, our next thing, which is uh, using CloudFront, okay? So I'm just gonna make my way back here to the homepage here and we'll move on to the next part. All right, so we're gonna take a look at CloudFront. So CloudFront is used as a CDN, a content distribution network. And the idea here is let's say you have uh, files uh, static files or video files that you want to share uh, across the world, but you want those uh, to load as quickly as possible and uh, make the shortest route to the end user. And that is where uh, CloudFront, which is a content, content distribution network comes in. So it's going to uh, take uh, whatever your static content is, and it's going to uh, then um, copy it to multiple edge locations around the world. And so when someone tries to access your content, it's going to go to that nearby edge location uh, as, as opposed to going really far away to get that content. So let's make our way over uh, to CloudFront here. So just drop down services and type in CloudFront, okay? And uh, we will make our way over here. And we're going to need to create ourselves a distribution and we'll just get started here. And I want you to drop this down and just choose that S3 uh, bucket that we created, okay? Um, and pretty much all the settings here are totally fine. So we're just gonna go uh, down below here and create that distribution. Okay, and creating distributions take uh, quite uh, some time to uh, to happen. But the idea there is, remember how I uploaded that one file to my uh, bucket there? So what this distribution is gonna do, it's going to copy that file and then move it to all those servers around the world uh, so that now my content is uh, super fast, okay? Um, and just like Elastic Load Balancer, um, where it had a DNS um, uh, name where you could hit it like a domain name to access uh, those instances, CloudFront is similar. So here we have a domain name here. So your traffic would hit this domain name uh, and then it would then route your traffic to the nearest uh, edge location, okay? So uh, that's all there really is to it here. Uh, distributions take a really long time to create, so um, we don't really need to uh, wait for this to uh, complete. So I'm going to just disable this here, okay? And it's going to just disable, and once it's disabled, you can delete it. Even if you don't delete it, it's not going to cost you uh, anything here, because it will be disabled. Um, but yeah, once it's done disabling, you can go ahead and select it and then delete it, all right? So that's CloudFront. All right, so now we're going to look at RDS, which stands for Relational Database Service, and it is for setting up relational databases. So I want you to make your way over to uh, the RDS console. So go to the top here and type RDS, and uh, we'll click that. And once in the, we're here in the console, we're going to create ourselves a new database. Uh, so on the left-hand side here, go to Databases, and then Create a Database. And we're gonna be presented with uh, quite a few uh, options here. Okay, um, and so um, by default, it has the Amazon Aurora engine selected. Uh, this is one of the most expensive options, so we definitely do not want to use that. Uh, so we will just use Postgres uh, for our case here. And the next thing is we have some templates to get us started here. And so we have production, dev test, and free tier. Uh, and uh, these are all suited for different needs. So the idea with production is if you are um, a, a larger, a very, a very large company, they're setting you up with every uh, bell and whistle under the sun here where dev test is for small to medium size uh, companies and free tier is uh, definitely just for uh, gaining hands-on experience, which is what we're doing here, or just for testing uh, simple applications. So I just wanna show you the price difference here. So they have a calculation down below. So if I scroll all the way down below here, you can see that uh, for production, it's $600 a month, which is uh, quite a bit of money. Uh, and then if we have a dev test and we scroll down here, now it's $262, still quite expensive. Um, and then we go to the free tier and now uh, there is no cost shown because it is free, okay? But um, you only get um, 750 hours on RDS and so uh, for a T2 micro, and then once that is um, used up, then uh, if you use the T2 micro for a month, it will cost you around $15 per month. 
Uh, and again, if you are a very small startup, uh, you can run on the free tier and the lowest tier for quite a while. Um, but you know, for some reason, uh, AWS decides to always have the most expensive one selected here with RDS. So we just have to be careful there. So let's go to free tier because it is the use case for us. Um, we have the DB instance identifier. We'll leave that alone. That's totally fine. We need to set a password. So I'm just going to type in Postgres123. Okay, and then Postgres123. Um, then you have your DB instance size. We, of course, want to leave it on uh, T2 micro here because we want to uh, have the smallest instance. There's nothing smaller. There's no nano here on RDS like EC2. Uh, then we choose our storage. It's set to 20 gigabytes. Um, there is auto scaling for storage. So it will automatically increase the size if that runs out. I'm going to turn that off because we don't need that. You have your multi AZ. Uh, you can determine where uh, this RDS should launch, like what VPC. We're going to leave in the default. For uh, database authentication, we can uh, use the standard password authentication. Or if you want to allow IAM users to authenticate directly, you can use that, which is pretty cool. I'm just going to leave it to password authentication. And then we have additional configuration, which you definitely want to set. So you have your initial database name. So if you do not specify database name, RDS uh, does not create a database. So I'm pretty sure we want to create a database here. So we're going to have to name this here. So I'm going to call this exam pro uh, fresh. Okay. And uh, we're going to turn backups uh, off, okay? And oh, I guess apparently I can't, I can't use a hyphen there, so I'll just remove that. Um, actually, it looks like I can use an underscore. Um, and so, uh, but anyway, so if we turn this off to zero days, that means it's not going to take a snapshot um, uh, right away or a backup right away. It's going to launch a lot faster. And we're not doing much with a server, so um, you know, let's just get through this as quickly as possible. We don't need a uh, performance insight, so I'm going to turn that off as well. And um, yeah, we were all good to go. So we'll go ahead and create that database. Okay. And um, so we're just going to wait for the creation of that database there. Um, and it will just take a little bit of time here and we'll be back in a moment. All right. So now our database is available here uh, and you can just see when clicking into it that we get stuff such as the CPU usage currently and uh, how many current connections are uh, uh, connected to uh, this database here. Um, now, in order to actually access this database, you'd have to assemble uh, all the uh, requirements. So you'd have to use this endpoint, you'd need this port number, uh, we need the database name, the username and password, which we had set earlier. And then you could use a traditional tool, maybe a uh, table plus or something to make a connection and start uh, using that database, okay? But uh, you know, for our purposes, it was just a matter of showing how easy it is to create a database here. Um, and so now uh, that we have created our own database, let's go ahead and just destroy that database, okay? Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead here and I just have to type in delete me. Okay, and that's RDS for you. So uh, this will uh, just delete here. I'm just gonna hit refresh and we're totally good here. I'm just gonna go back uh, to uh, the uh, management console. So we're gonna take a look at AWS Lambda here uh, and see how to run a Lambda function. So what I want you to do is go to the top here to services and just type in a Lambda and we'll make our way over to the Lambda console. And uh, once we're in here, I want you to go ahead and create a new function. And we are going to author one from scratch. So I'm just gonna say my Lambda, okay. And we have a bunch of different runtimes that we can choose here. We have Node.js, et cetera. I'm gonna choose Ruby because that's uh, my language of choice. Uh, we're gonna drop down here um, and we are going to have it create us a new role with basic Lambda permissions so that it can write to CloudWatch logs. And we're gonna go ahead and create that function. Okay, great. So that function has now been uh, set up here for us. And if we just scroll down here, you can see that we have this nice little inline editor uh, that allows us to um, uh, work on our function. Okay. And so the big benefit of Lambda, it's uh, you don't have to worry about the, the servers. You just write your code and it will run. Uh, the trade-off here is though that these uh, only run for a small amount of time. So Lambda can only run uh, for up to 15 minutes, but generally they, they only run for uh, one second or less. Um, that's generally how they're used. Let's go ahead here and let's just put a puts in here so I can just say hello world, uh, just so we can see that our Lambda works. 
And uh, what we can do here is we can go up and uh, make a test. So I'm just going to go ahead here and make a test. And we already have one here called Hello World. Um, and I'm just going to type this in again. Hello World. Um, here. Oh, maybe I have to do this. And I'm just going to hit Create there. And so now I have a test. And I'm just going to go ahead and hit Test there. And we can see that it succeeded. Um, and we get a status code. So this is what it would returned. And if we were to go um, check the logging here. Um, if we were to go to monitoring here, all right, um, we should be able to see that that puts that we have there. Okay, so we just click on this button here, view logs in CloudWatch, and we can see that Lambda ran there. Um, and you know, I don't, the reason I don't have any output here is I forgot to hit save. They're really finicky about that. And now if I hit test, okay, it's worked. Uh, and now the output here actually has hello world. Okay, so that's from the logs. But if I go back here and give this a hard refresh here, okay, I might have to go back one step here because now it's in this one up here. And um, we should have our, our puts. Uh, did I click the right one? Maybe it just has, oh, there it is. Okay, so I was just impatient here, but it's shown up. So there you go. So um, you can see lambdas are pretty darn simple. Um, and just going back here up to the function, uh, lambdas get triggered from a variety of different services. So if you want to add a, a trigger, you can go here and drop down and choose a service. So you could have it so anytime something is inserted into DynamoDB, um, it would then trigger that Lambda function or from a variety of things, okay? And there's even integration with uh, um, third-party um, third uh, Amazon partners, okay? So yeah, that's all we need to know for Lambda. So we're going to take a look at the EC2 pricing model, and there are four ways we can pay with EC2. We have on-demand, spot, reserved, and dedicated. And we're going to go through each section and see uh, where each one is, uh, makes sense. So we're going to take first a look at on-demand pricing. And this is whenever you launch an EC2 instance, it's going to by default use on-demand. And so on-demand has no upfront payment and no long-term commitment. You're only charged by the hour or by the minute. It's going to vary based on the EC2 instance type. Uh, and that's how the pricing is going to work. And you might think, okay, what's the use case here? Well, on-demand is for applications where the workload is short-term, spiky or unpredictable. When you have a new app for development or you want to just run an experiment, this is where on-demand is going to be a good fit for you. So we're taking a look at reserved instances, also known as RI, and these are going to give you the best uh, long-term savings. And it's designed for applications that have steady state, predictable usage, or require reserved capacity. So what you're doing is you're saying to AWS, um, you know, I'm going to make a commitment to you, um, and I'm going to be using this over an X period of time, and they're going to give you savings, okay? So this reduced pricing is going to be based on three variables. We have term, class offerings, and payment options, and we'll walk through these things to see how they all work. So for payment options, we have standard, convertible, and scheduled. Standard is going to give us the greatest savings uh, with 75% reduced pricing, uh, and this is compared, obviously, to on-demand. Uh, the th thing here, though, is that you cannot change the RI attributes, attributes being like instance type, right? So whatever you have, you're, you're stuck with it. Now, if you need a bit more flexibility because you might need to have more room to grow in the future, you'd look at convertible. So the savings aren't going to be as great. We're looking at uh, up to 54%. But now you have the ability to, let's say, change your instance type to a larger size. You can't go smaller, but you can always go larger. Uh, and you're, But you're going to have some flexibility there. Then there's scheduled. And this is when you need to reserve instances for a specific time period. This could be the case where you always have a workload that's predictable every single uh, Friday for a couple hours. Uh, and the idea is by telling AWS that you're going to be uh, doing that on schedule, they will give you savings there. That's going to vary. The other uh, two things is term and payment options. So terms is how long are you willing to commit? One year or a three-year contract? The greater the, the, uh, the terms, the greater the savings. And you have payment options. So you have all upfront, uh, partial upfront, and no upfront. No upfront's the most interesting one because you could say, um, you know, I'm going to use a server for a year, uh, and you and you'll just pay at the end of the month. And so that is a really good way of saving money um, uh, right off the bat. Uh, a lot of people don't seem to know that. So you know, mix those three together, and that's going to change the uh, the outcome there. And I do here have a graphic to show you that you can select things, and to just show you how they would. Um, uh, 
uh, estimate the actual cost for you. Uh, a couple things you want to know about reserved instances that can be shared between multiple accounts within a single organization. And unreserved RIs can be sold in the reserved instance marketplace. So if you do buy into a one or three year contract, you're not fully out of luck because you can always try to resell it to somebody else who might want to use it. So there you go. So now we're taking a look at spot instances and they have the opportunity to give you the biggest savings with 90% discount compared to on-demand pricing. There are some caveats though. So AWS has all this unused compute capacity. So they wanna maximize the utility of their idle servers. It's no different than when a hotel offers discounts to fill vacant suites or when a plane uh, offers discounts to fill vacant seats. Okay, so there's just EC2 instances lying around. It would be better uh, to give people discounts than uh, for them to do nothing. Um, so the only caveat though, is that when you use spot instances, if another customer who wants to pay on demand a higher price uh, uh, wants to use it and um, they need to give that capacity to that on demand user, this instance can be terminated at any given time, okay? Um, and that's gonna be the trade-off. So just looking at termination, termination conditions down below. Instances can be terminated by AWS at any time. If your instance is terminated by AWS, you don't get charged for uh, the, the partial hour of usage. But if you were to terminate an instance, you will still be charged for any hour that it ran, okay? So there you go. That's the little caveat to it. Um, but what would you use spot instances for if, it can, if these uh, instances could be interrupted at any time? Well, they're designed for applications that have flexible start and end times or applications that are only feasible at very low compute costs. And so you can see I pulled out um, uh, the configuration graphic when you make spot. So it's saying like, is it for load balancing workloads, flexible workloads, big data workloads, or defined duration workloads? So you can see there uh, is some definitions as to what kind of utility you would have there, but there you are. So we're taking a look at dedicated host instances, which is our most expensive option with EC2 pricing models. Um, and it's designed to meet regulatory requirements when you have strict server bound licensing that won't support multi-tenancy or cloud deployments. So to really understand dedicated hosts, we need to understand multi-tenant versus single tenant. So whenever you launch an EC2 instance um, and it's using on-demand or, or any of the other types beside dedicated hosts, it's multi-tenant, meaning uh, you are sharing the same hardware as other um, AWS uh, customers, and the only separation between you and other customers is through virtualized isolation, which is software, okay? Then you have single tenant, and this is when a single customer has dedicated hardware, and so customers are separated through physical isolation, all right? And so to just compare these two, I think of multi-tenant as like everyone uh, living in an apartment, and single tenant is everyone living in a house, all right? So you know, why would we want to have our own dedicated hardware? Well, large enterprises and organizations may have security concerns or obligations about sharing the same hardware with other AWS customers. So it really just boils down to that. Um, with um, dedicated hosts, um, it comes in an on-demand flavor and a reserved flavor, okay? So you can save up to 70%. But overall, dedicated hosts is way more expensive uh, than our other EC2 pricing options. So we're on to the EC2 pricing cheat sheet, and this one is a two-pager, but we'll make our way through it. So EC2 has four pricing models. We have on-demand spot, reserved instances, also known as RI, and dedicated. Looking first at on-demand, it requires the least commitment from you. Uh, it is low cost and flexible. Uh, you only pay per hour. Uh, and the use cases here are for short-term, spiky, unpredictable workloads or first-time applications. Uh, it's gonna be ideal when you want workloads that cannot be interrupted, whereas in Spot, um, that's when you can have interruption. We'll get to that here shortly. Uh, so on to reserved instances, you can save up to 75% off. It's gonna give you the best long-term value. The use case here are steady state or predictable usage. Uh, you can resell unused reserved instances in the reserved instance marketplace. The reduced pricing is going to be based off of these three variables, terms, class offering, and payment option. So for payment terms, we have a one-year or a three-year contract. With payment options, we can either pay all upfront, partial upfront, or no upfront. And we have three class offerings. We have standard, convertible, and scheduled. So for standard, we're going to get up to 75% reduced pricing compared to on-demand. But you cannot change those RA attributes, meaning like if you want to change to a larger instance type, it's 
it's not going to be possible. You're stuck with what you have. Uh, if you want a bit more flexibility, we have convertible where you can get up to 54% off and you get that flexibility. Uh, as long as those RA attributes are greater than or equal in value, you can uh, change those values. Then you have scheduled and this is used, uh, this is for reserved instances for specific time periods. So maybe you want to run something once a week for a few hours and the savings here are going to vary. Now onto our last two pricing models, we have spot pricing, which is up to 90% off. It's gonna give you the biggest savings. Uh, what you're doing here is you're requesting spare computing capacity. So, you know, as we said earlier, it's like um, hotel rooms where they're just trying to fill the vacant suites. Um, if you are, if you're comfortable with flexible start and end times, spot pricing is going to be good for you. The use case here is if you can handle interruptions, so servers randomly stopping and starting. Uh, it's uh, a very good use case is for cr non-critical background jobs. Instances can be terminated by AWS at any time. If your instance is terminated by AWS, you won't get charged uh, for that partial hour of usage. If you terminate that instance, you will be charged for any hour that it ran in. Okay, and the last is dedicated. Hosting, it's the most expensive option, uh, and it's just dedicated servers. Okay, um, and so it can be uh, it can be utilized in on demand or reserve. So you can save up to seventy percent off. Um, and the use case here is when you need a guarantee of isolate hardware. So this is like enterprise requirements. So there you go. We made it all, all the way through EC2 pricing. All right, so there are many AWS services that do not incur a cost. And so these are free services. Um, so for example, IM, which is used for creating uh, users and groups and roles uh, to access uh, different resources, uh, creating any of those components of IM are not going to uh, incur a cost. So IM is essentially a free service where you have these other services which are free uh, such as auto scaling, cloud formation, Elastic Beanstalk, everything in this blue box, but they um, can provision other AWS services which cost money. So on the exam, I would not be surprised if you come across a question which kind of implies that CloudFormation uh, might uh, incur a cost, but you just need to know that the service itself is free, but it can provision other services, okay? So I've highlighted in bold here the services which I think would most likely show up on the exam, but I've given you more of a full list of things that definitely do not cost money. Um, so there you go. So AWS has four different support plans to help you out when uh, you need it. And when you first make an AWS account, you by default are in the basic um, uh, support plan. And this is gonna give you access via email for billing and uh, account information. So it, let's say you uh, aren't sure about the cost of something, or you think that you might've uh, been overbilled, or you are suspecting that you may be overbilled uh, because you might've misconfigured something. Uh, you have this available to you at all tiers. Um, but yeah, that's the first thing that you have access to. Uh, and so you just send them an email and they'll help you resolve that. Now coming into the paid tiers, we're gonna start with developer starting at $20 USD. Um, and this is gonna give you access to technical support via email, okay? And generally they will reply within 24 hours, uh, but they do allow you to choose the response time, like the nature of the issue, which is going to determine how fast they reply. And so we have general guidance and system impaired, okay? Now in the developer tier, it does not provide third-party support. So let's say you had a web application, whether it's Ruby on Rails or Django or ExpressJS, and it's running on an EC2 instance. AWS is going to help you with the EC2 instance, but they're not gonna help you with the actual um, third-party uh, part, which would be, um, you know, again, uh, Rails or, or Django and et cetera, okay? Um, so, uh, uh, so, you know, that's what it's gonna be limited to. Um, going into the next tier business, which starts at 100 uh, USD, um, this is now where you're going to have access to um, chat and phone, and this is any times, okay? So if you want to call them at 3 a.m. in the morning, you uh, can or, or chat with them. And generally, uh, it might be a bit slower uh, to connect with them, but they definitely will connect with you, and you can work through uh, your problems, okay? Uh, so uh, the other advantage here is that now that you can do chat and phone, you can also do screen sharing with them. So they can actually send you over a link, and now they can see your uh, screen, and they can work through the problem with you. And this is uh, extremely useful and uh, um, uh, definitely makes uh, the business here um, something worth purchasing, especially if you're running a production system, okay? You're also gonna get faster uh, response times uh, in the case of if you have a production system impaired or down, 
Okay, so this might be important to you. Um, and so also the business tier and enterprise tier uh, uh, does support th uh, third party, okay? So um, on these tiers, they will make the best effort to try to help you through things that aren't AWS related uh, to solve your problem, okay? So that is an additional bonus there. Now coming into the enterprise account, this is the most expensive uh, plan starting at 15,000 USD. Uh, it was uh, previously 10,000, but AWS has increased that. And this plan is special because you actually get two dedicated resources. These, uh, and why when I say resources, I mean people. And so you get a personal concierge and a TAM, which stands for technical account manager. And also uh, you have a, a new response time where they can respond within 15 minutes. Uh, in the case for a business critical system down, okay? So um, there's that. And then we have advisor checks, okay? So for advisor checks for the basic developer, we have seven. And then for business and enterprise, we get all checks. Uh, we have another section in this um, uh, course here where we co cover trusted advisors so you can see what all those checks are. Uh, but for the exam, you're going to need to know the difference uh, uh, pricing for the different tiers. You're going to need to know those uh, response times, the 24, 12, 4, 1 hour, 15 minutes. You need to know um, when are people assigned to your account. It's only in the enterprise. Um, you're going to need to know when third-party support is, is there or not. Um, yeah, so there you go. So here in this follow along, I want to show you how you would go ahead and create a case um, in AWS support. I am using uh, the business support plan here, and you can see that I have um, a bunch of different uh, support cases. I definitely have a lot on uh, CloudFront because it's given us a lot of trouble. Um, but anyway, let's work our way through this and create a new case here. And then you're gonna be presented with uh, a type of case you want to choose. So if you were on the basic tier, uh, technical support would be grayed out. Uh, you'd have access to both account uh, billing support and service uh, limit increase. So if I just click here, you can see um, here, if I want to uh, report a billing thing, I can choose the type. So I'd say billing, I would choose the category. So I could say, I have a question about the free tier. Uh, and then you could specify um, the response time here, okay? or I guess they call it the severity, and you'd write your uh, sub subject description. You can attach up to uh, three attachments there. Uh, and uh, you can only choose uh, to talk to them via email, okay? So we have chat and phone, but these are disabled. But I think the real interesting thing to show you in uh, support here is technical support, okay? So with technical support, this is where we're gonna be able to ask technical questions about um, AWS services. So if I wanted to drop something down and we would type in CloudFront here, because again, I said CloudFront is something we spend a lot of time on. Um, and then you would choose the category. And so now the category is going to narrow down based on the service. And on the right-hand side, they are gonna give you uh, su suggestions, okay? But we can go through here and say, um, I'm having an issue with um, caching, okay? And then you could choose the severity. So um, we'll just leave it at general. And then sometimes they ask you to provide additional information. It's optional, but it's going to save them time to help you out. You'd have to go through your account to find uh, those values. It's going to change based on the service. And then down below, we can uh, write in whatever we want. So I, I could say, I am having issues um, with my um, distribution. Okay. Uh, my cash values aren't showing up. Aren't being... Uh, served. Okay. And so uh, you could choose the um, preferred contact here. Now, this is very simple. You don't get any type of formatting or bolding. So you have to be a bit creative to uh, display that information. But you definitely want to try to create all the steps for them to uh, replicate it. Okay. And then down below, we have web, chat, or phone. So we'll give chat a try here. Okay. And I'm just going to hit submit. And then we will, what we will get here is um, a, a chat window pop up there. Okay. And so we'll just wait here for a little bit. Well, I just wanted to give you actually a better example here. So I just uh, uh, left that window there and opened up a previous case I had here. 
Uh, this one actually is with CloudFront Lambda Edge. And so it, once you are chatting with the cloud engineer, it will actually uh, save all this within the case later on. So if you need to uh, read what you were uh, talking about, um, that's going to be saved there later. If for whatever reason, the cloud engineer cannot solve it uh, and they need to go off and try to replicate it or reach out to someone else on the team, they will do so. And then they will come back to you uh, with the answer later. Um, and so they will uh, provide that there. And that's what happened in the case here. Okay, um, and uh, generally sometimes they will go out and actually bring back even more information uh, for you there. Okay, so you can even see that this cloud engineer had to go uh, talk to the cloud uh, formation team uh, to resolve uh, this case here. So you definitely uh, can uh, uh, really reach the experts within AWS uh, to solve your problem. So there you go. That's generally the uh, follow along here in a nutshell um, uh, for creating a case. Okay. So now we're taking a look at AWS Marketplace, which is a curated digital catalog with thousands of software listings from independent software vendors. It allows you to easily find, buy, test, and deploy software that already runs on AWS. So on the right-hand side there, you can see we have a bunch of categories such as operating system security, uh, machine learning. And the idea is that you would uh, click into one of those categories and now you have a bunch of uh, products that are being offered to you uh, in the form of Amazon machine images, CloudFormation templates, uh, uh, SaaS offerings, uh, WAF rules, and a variety of more. Uh, and these products can uh, either be free or they could have an associated charge, more likely the latter. Uh, and this charge will become part of your AWS bill. Uh, and if you want to uh, sell things yourself, uh, there is a sales channel for ISVs and consulting uh, partners. So you definitely uh, cannot just be the one buying, but also selling, okay? So in this follow along, I want to uh, show you the AWS marketplace and the things that you could possibly buy in here. So uh, just uh, looking here um, on the homepage here, we have a bunch of categories where we can narrow down uh, the thing that we're looking for, or we could choose a, a vendor if we uh, knew in particular what we want. You can see there's 1,361 vendors. So there's quite a few here. Or uh, if you want to determine your uh, pricing plans or delivery methods, okay? And then you have those popular categories, which is a very easy way to uh, start exploring. Uh, maybe we would be interested in machine learning. So I'll go ahead and uh, click there. Okay. And now that we are in machine learning, we can see that we have a variety of uh, different uh, offerings here. Uh, so let's say we wanted to uh, do some deep learning uh, with P uh, Python 3 and TensorFlow. I'm just going to click into here and it's going to give you um, an idea what kind of uh, product we have here. Uh, I believe this is an Amazon machine image. I'm just kind of trying to find where it says that. Uh, and right down there, so we see uh, that the delivery methods is an Amazon machine image. So it's going to determine uh, what that is. Uh, and we have a variety of information here, such as the product overview. It'll do uh, price estimating uh, estimations based on the EC2 instance that you choose. Um, and there could be useful information such as uh, how to actually use this. Okay. So uh, yeah, so if you wanted to do that, um, I mean, you could create a subscription from here, but generally when you're uh, launching Amazon machine images, you'd want to go ahead and uh, launch that uh, within the EC2 um, uh, console there. So let's hop our way over there and uh, try to uh, find something in the marketplace, okay? All right, so here I am in my AWS account and I'm gonna make my way over to EC2. Okay, so a lot of times when you want to use a marketplace resource, generally you're going to uh, launch it within uh, the context of what service you're using. So uh, there are WAF rules that are sold within the marketplace. So when you're using WAF in the WAF console, you can purchase them there. And when it's gonna be an AMI, it's going to be via EC2. Okay, so I would just go ahead here and launch an instance. And uh, as soon as I uh, launch an instance here or get to the option to choose to launch an instance, whenever it decides to load, uh, we are going to be presented with uh, the AMI that we need to choose, okay? All right, so uh, now we can choose our AMI. And on the left-hand side, you're going to see AWS Marketplace. And so this is where it's going to make it easy for us to uh, choose a, um, a service there and subscribe to it. So um, if we wanted that machine learning one, I think it was TensorFlow, okay? So we type TensorFlow there. Um, not quite exactly the same one, but if we just wanted to uh, launch one here, um, so here we have Deep Learning AMI, which is an Ubuntu image. Um, 
and it would have some kind of associated cost here. So I go here and select it, okay? And right away, it's going to show me um, the pricing here. Um, I don't see any additional cost, probably because this one is an AWS deep learning AMI. It probably doesn't have any additional cost, but it does estimate that stuff out there. So maybe we'll go back and actually choose something where I know there will definitely be a cost. Uh, maybe we try um, launching uh, guacamole, okay? So guacamole is a, <laughs> if you can spell it, is a um, is a bastion. I'll just type in bastion. That's an easier way to find it. And so here's guacamole. It gives you a free trial. And here you can see the pricing here. So you see 0 0.3 cents to 30, uh, 3.52 cents per hour. And so I will just go ahead and select that, okay? And choose that AMI. And it can tell you that it has a free instance. And then you'd hit uh, continue, okay? And then you just uh, launch your instance. So Based on uh, this here, I'm, I'm restricted to that. So I'll just do a small here and I'm just gonna go ahead and review and launch. Okay, and this is definitely not part of the free tier. So I'm gonna definitely want to destroy this immediately after creating it, okay? But I just wanna show you how easy it is to um, uh, uh, create something uh, from the EC2 marketplace here, okay? We'll just download that and launch that, all right? And so now um, I actually have a subscription uh, to that market pay, uh, uh, place service, okay? So as that is launching there, it usually doesn't take this long, but today it seems to be a bit slower. I wanna show you um, the actual AWS Marketplace subscription. So when you start uh, accumulating uh, subscriptions, you can go to the AWS Marketplace subscriptions here and see that apparently it's not supported in the Canada region. So we'll have to move over to US East. Um, that's not uncommon for AWS because a lot of times um, uh, with billing uh, and other things. They are only available in the US East region. But here you can see we have guacamole, okay? And it's saying our trial ends in five days. And then I have over here a lamp uh, certified by Bitnami and it has no additional cost. So if you are using a bunch of things from the marketplace and you're trying to keep track of them, uh, this is where you're going to uh, find that information, okay? So, I mean, that's pretty much all you need to know for the AWS marketplace. Um, and I'm just going to make sure to uh, shut down that uh, instance uh, there uh, since I do actually uh, not want to do anything with it, okay? But I just wanted to show you how easy it was to start uh, subscribing uh, to a resource there. So I'm just going to go here and quickly uh, uh, shut down that instance there. So if you're following along, you do the same. So I'll just go ahead here and terminate that instance. Okay, and there we go. Hey, this is Angie Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at Trusted Advisor, which advises you on security, saving money, performance, uh, service limits, and fault tolerance. The reason I have that uh, saving money in red is because we are looking at billing and pricing, okay? And for Trusted Advisor, uh, for every single account, uh, you're gonna get for free seven Trust Advisor checks. If you have either business or enterprise support, you're gonna get all Trusted Advisor checks. And an easy way of thinking what Trusted Advisor is, is think of it as an automated checklist for best practices on AWS. So Trusted Advisor um, has five different categories where it can advise you on, and it has uh, checks, and these are all the checks uh, that are possible um, that are at the uh, paid tiers, okay? For the uh, free tier, uh, there's quite a few less. Uh, I can, honestly can't remember what they are, so I'm not gonna show them here to you. Um, and we're just gonna focus on the full list here going through each category. So first looking at cost optimization where you're gonna be able to save money. The two most common ones where uh, it will recommend you on is idle load balancers and unassociated EIP. So for idle load balancers, the, uh, so if you spin up an elastic load balancer, the minimum cost per month is $15, okay? But let's say you just don't happen to have any EC2 instances that are being balanced on there. It's going to say, hey, this load balancer is not doing anything. Maybe you should uh, get rid of it to save some money. Another one is uh, EIPs. So that's Elastic IP addresses, okay? And so uh, the idea is that if you have an EC2 instance and you want to give it a static IP, uh, you can uh, 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 reserve an EIP, uh, an EIP from AWS. Uh, but the thing is, is that if it's not attached to an EC2 instance, it's unassociated, it costs you money because AWS wants you to release that, uh, that IP address so someone else can use it. Uh, so that's a recommendation it will make to you. Looking at performance, uh, let's say we look at high utilization Amazon EC2 instances. So for that one, I believe that uh, it's, let's say you have a very high CPU usage on an on EC2 instance, it's gonna say, hey, maybe you should use a larger instance, okay, to get better performance out of this, um, this machine here, okay? Now for security, we have MFA on root account. 
Um, and this is uh, not only Trust Advisor tells you to do this, but so many other AWS services tell you to do it because it's such a uh, important security measure within your AWS account. Another thing could be I am access key rotation. So you have uh, access keys that are used by uh, users and it might suggest, hey, it's time to rotate these out to make sure things stay secure, okay? So uh, looking at the last two categories, we have fault tolerance and service limits. So for fault tolerance, uh, it would recommend, so let's say something for RDS backups, okay? So just to make sure that uh, you have backups in place or have them turned on. So uh, in the case that your database goes down, you can uh, recover it, okay? Uh, and then you have service limits, um, and there's none in particular chosen here, but uh, there are limitations on the certain amount of things that you can use, and AWS allows you to increase those limits. Uh, so it's just kind of like a safeguard for AWS, but you're allowed to go beyond that. I guess a really good one would be SCS. So SCS allows you to send out emails, and probably by default, it, it caps you at like 5,000 or 10,000 emails. And if you had to go beyond that, you would ask for a service limit increase, okay? So those are all the checks there, uh, and the five categories to give you an idea of what Trust Advisor can help you with. So in this follow along, I want to show you um, Trusted Advisor dashboard and how it makes recommendations to you uh, and how you can keep up to date uh, when uh, it discovers new things. Okay, so here in this exam pro account, we have business applied. So we have all the AWS advisor checks. So let's go take a look at cost optimization here. Uh, and you can see that we have things in green. So these things are A-OK. -okay. And then you have things with warnings. And one thing we uh, explored earlier was unassociated, unassociated elastic IP addresses. So if we expand there, it's gonna show us that we have one IP address in our US East region that's not currently associated with any running instance. So this thing is costing us money, okay? So, uh, so then you'd have to go take action and go over uh, to, I believe it's in VPC, um, the VPC console, and then uh, just unassociate that and you'd start saving money, okay? And so we have that for a bunch of categories here. Uh, if you wanted to download a report, I believe you could go up here and download an XLS. Yep, that's an XLS there. So you can bring that into Excel and, and uh, look at that information. But the number one thing I want you to show you is preferences. And under preferences, you can actually set up email uh, notifications on a weekly basis. So you would just set those uh, email addresses, checkbox them, save those preferences, and you would uh, uh, get um, these notifications anytime there would be a change uh, where it has recommendations for you, you could take action on that. So that is uh, all you really need to know for Trust Advisors. So there you go. So we're going to take a look here at consolidating billing, uh, which is a feature that is turned on by default when you're using AWS organizations and you have multiple member accounts. So you're going to have one account that's considered your master account within your organization. And then you'll have all these member accounts underneath and all of their uh, billing information is going to be sent to the master account. Uh, as well as the master account is going to be responsible for paying uh, the charges for all its member accounts. Okay, so it makes billing uh, very simple and straightforward. Uh, and also, uh, you'll be able to use Cost Explorer to visualize the usage of uh, the billing uh, per account. So if you wanted to see all the expenses uh, just for the developer account or the data science, science uh, account or the security account, uh, you're going to be able to segment that data within Cost Explorer. Um, consolidated billing is offered at no, uh, uh, no additional cost, okay? And if you do have a, a member account and you have it leave the organization, that cost explore data is gonna be no longer available. So just uh, keep that in uh, consideration, okay? So another thing we want to touch on about consolidating billing is volume discounts. So AWS has volume discounts for many services. So what that means is uh, the more you use something, the more you are going to save, okay? Uh, and so consolidate, uh, consolidated billing lets you take advantage of volume discounts because it's going to uh, take the usage for multiple accounts and treat it as one. And then whatever uh, that surplus of uh, from another account is going to end up in another bracket of um, of lower discounts. So just to really illustrate this here, uh, we have uh, usage from two different accounts. We have Odo's usage and data's uh, DAX's usage uh, for data transfer, okay? And so the data transfer is going to cost uh, at the first 10 terabytes, 
uh, 17 cents per gigabyte, and the next 40 gigabytes is going to be a 13 cents per gigabyte. Okay, so if you were just paying for Odo's usage and DAX usage separately, uh, which would be unconsolidated, you could see that it comes out to 2,088 and 96 cents. Okay, but when you consolidate uh, the billing and uh, group the total usage, you're going to have that usage uh, uh, overflow into tier two, which is where you're going to save that money. Okay, and so now you can see with the consolidated billing, it's going to be 2,000 seven dollars and four cents so we have roughly there about eighty dollars worth of saving okay and so if we if those costs uh, weren't consolidated uh, we wouldn't get those savings so that's one uh, motivation for you to uh, take your individual accounts and make sure they're in an organization okay Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and we are looking at AWS Cost Explorer, which helps you visualize, understand, and manage your AWS costs and usage over time. Uh, so uh, with Cost Explorer, uh, if you have multiple AWS accounts within an organization, all the costs will be consolidated into the master account. So Cost Explorer is very good at uh, giving, getting an overview of all your costs, no matter uh, what accounts they are in. Uh, within AWS Cost Explorer, uh, you have these things called reports, okay? And AWS gives you a bunch of reports uh, by default that you can use. Um, so if you need to uh, start breaking costs down uh, based on services or et cetera, uh, they're just one click away. And you, of course, can make your own uh, reports. Uh, within Cost Explorer, it has a feature called forecasting, which allows you to see future costs. Uh, so you can plan uh, for uh, uh, the future or maybe make adjustments so you can lower your bill. Um, within Cost Explorer, if you want to view the data monthly or daily, that is an option that is uh, available to you. Uh, and uh, you get these nice graphs within Cost Explorer. So uh, you can uh, group the uh, information in a variety of different ways. You can see there's tons of different uh, ways. And you can also filter uh, uh, based on a lot of options there. So if you want to filter out very specific services or, or uh, uh, very specific regions or based on tags, or maybe you just want to look at one particular um, uh, like accounts, so maybe you have a developer account, you just want to see what they're spending, then you uh, you can use those filters to narrow that stuff down, all right? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are going to do a quick follow along here in uh, AWS Cost Explorer here, okay? And so here I have an Exam Pro uh, AWS account, which uh, has some expenses within it. So hopefully we will uh, find some uh, useful information here uh, to look at as an example on how would you use Cost Explorer. So here I am on the home, right? So if I was to click here, this is what we would see. And right away, uh, we're gonna get month, uh, month to date costs. So here so far, we've spent $185 uh, this month. Uh, and then it's forecasting uh, $466.18. Uh, I do need to point out that these forecast forecasted monthly costs can be misleading. So if you have a large uh, spike or bill, um, uh, at the start of a month because you might have large services. So like you paying for AWS support or you're registering uh, domains like one-time fixed costs. Uh, this value here can be extremely misleading. So next month I'm not paying $466. I definitely know that. Um, but you know, just be aware of that if, if you see that and it, uh, it might shock you. Okay. Uh, so, um, just to start looking at information, we can go to explore costs. Okay. And right away now we have our nice graph here and it allows us to now, uh, filter this, uh, data however we want. So here we have that group by, and so the most convenient one is generally by service. Okay. And so what you'll get is a stacked bar graph here, uh, which will break down uh, service costs. Now it doesn't always show everything. As you can see here, we have uh, our, our business support, our RDS, uh, some other EC2 instances that are probably managed by AWS, maybe um, ECS or something. Uh, then we have Kinesis Analytics, and then we have others, okay? So uh, you don't get a full picture there, but they do have uh, costs listed down below. You can download the CSV uh, and uh, work with this uh, raw data here, okay? And you could break this down monthly, so I can go to monthly here, okay? And then this would just change the graph, so now it's a monthly uh, breakdown, and you can change the scope of how far you want to go back there, okay? but we'll just go back there and change it to daily. And apparently we have some other options here. So if you don't like stacked and you like line graphs, you can have that, or if you like bars, okay. But stack uh, stack uh, is my preference there. Okay, and then on the right-hand side, we have filters. So if we wanna uh, start filtering, it might look like this is grayed out, but what you do is you actually click here, 
okay? And so then I could type something like registrar, okay? If I uh, can remember how to spell it, there we go. And that's for registering domains on Route 53. And uh, if I just apply that filter there, you can see I have uh, one cost there, okay? And there's tons of different filters in here, okay? Tons and tons. Uh, but like the one that you'll notice the most is like linked accounts. So if you wanted to filter out for like a developer account, like AWS account or so like a variety of different accounts, you can do that to figure out the exact costs of um, uh, particular uh, teams. Okay, um, and so that's that there. Um, now, just to show you those reports, there are those uh, default reports here. If you go on the left-hand side here, we can go to save reports. Okay, and so here are a bunch of them there and you can get an idea of what's uh, inside of them, okay? But uh, yeah, you basically would just create whatever configuration you want. Oops, I went into reserved uh, utilization there. I don't care about that. But yeah, whatever whatever filters you want, you just go ahead and make any report. Um, and you go cost and usage, okay? And um, from there, once you pit, choose your configuration, you hit save and you can have this report for later, okay? So if you really wanna monitor uh, like CloudFront, so CloudFront is something that we heavily use at Exam Pro and it can fluctuate based on uh, how many people are consuming videos on our platform. We might want to just create a report for CloudFront, okay? Um, so yeah, uh, there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at AWS Budgets, which is a service that helps you plan service usage, service costs, and instance reservations. I like to think of it as billing alarms on steroids. And when you use AWS Budgets, uh, each budget costs about uh, two cents uh, per day. Okay, and you have up to a, a, a limit of 20,000 uh, budgets, but the first two budgets are free of charge. So if you have an AWS account, you definitely wanna go ahead and create yourself a couple of budgets, okay? All right, so we're looking at ABIS budgets here in a little bit more detail. And so the idea here is that you can set up alerts if you exceed or are approaching your defined budget. There are three types of budgets you can create. Um, you have cost, usage, and reservation, okay? So cost is where you're just plugging in a dollar amount there, okay? Uh, for usage, it's going to be based on a usage unit. So you could choose something such as EC2 running hours, and then you're going to supply whatever the unit is. So that's gonna be hours in this case. So here I've supplied 100. Uh, and you can track budgets based on monthly, quarterly, or yearly levels, okay? Uh, and so it just if you set it for a year, then that alert is really going to be uh, designed to be delivered at the end of the year, okay? Um, so uh, for reservations, uh, that is for reserved instances, and AWS Budget supports uh, EC2, Redshift, uh, RDS, and Elastic Cache, okay? Now, when you are uh, defining your budgets, you can define them based on a fixed cost, or you can plan, uh, plan it up front based on your chosen level. So you could say for, uh, for each, so for the next six months, you could say for this month, I wanna spend this, and for this month, I wanna spend that, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And if it was quarterly, you could say what you'd want those uh, budgets to be for those quarters, okay? You can also easily manage AWS budgets via the dashboard, and they also have an API. So if you need to do something pragmatic, you can definitely do something there. Uh, and normally you'd get notified by email, but you could also um, have the uh, notification sent to chatbot, okay? So for chatbot, uh, that is a newer service for AWS. Uh, it integrates with uh, common services such as uh, Slack or Chime. So those could, uh, your budget information can be pushed out to there, okay? Hey, this is Angie Brown from Exam Pro, and we are going to look at AWS budgets in this follow along and learn how to uh, set our own budget. So we'll go ahead here and create our, uh, our budget here. All right, and so we're gonna be presented with either a cost budget, a usage budget, or a reservation budget. So I'm gonna choose cost, and we're gonna set uh, your budget. And so they give you a suggestion like monthly EC2 budget, okay. And um, I could just say all my costs. So uh, overall, overall costs, okay. And uh, then we can choose the period. So monthly seems good to me, but you have monthly, quarterly, and annually here, all right? You can have a recurring budget or expiring. We want this for every single month. Uh, and then you can choose your budget amount. So we have a fixed or a monthly uh, budget uh, planning. This is a little bit more complicated. So I guess if you're a startup and you assumed your costs were going up, you want to fill this go up and up and up. Or if you were a seasonal business and you assume your budget would change based on the demand, it would definitely make sense to uh, set 
monthly budget planning, okay? But we'll go back to fixed here and we can just have a cost. You can see it shows my last month cost was $126. Let's just say I wanted my cost to always be $100 per month. It will draw this line here and give me an idea of whether I'm over or under, okay? And we could filter services. So if I wanted to go here, I could just choose um, EC2, okay? And I'm just going to uh, look for EC2. I'm not sure why it didn't show up in search. No, let's just do RDS instead because that was just a bit easier to find here. So I'll apply filter. Uh, so, but just an idea to show you uh, just how that works there. Okay, and I'm just going to uh, remove that filter there. Uh, if I can figure that out, there we are. Okay, and we'll just apply that filter again. Um, and we do have some advanced options there, but everything seems uh, pretty good. So I'm just going to go ahead and configure alerts. Okay, and so you can get alerted if you're if you go over the budget. So you can get it based on the actual cost or forecasted. I would get so many emails if I, or at least I'd always get a email if I had forecasted because forecasts uh, within my account are always spiked. Okay, but uh, here you could set the alert threshold. So when you're approaching that budget, so let's say you're 80% on the way there, it should send you an email. Uh, and then you would add your contact here. So I could just say Andrew at exampro.co. Okay, um, maybe I did that button. Yeah, just the one there. Okay, um, and you could also notify via uh, Amazon SNS. So if you already have a topic on, you could provide that there. But apparently you do not have to do that uh, here, which is kind of nice. And apparently they have a new feature, which is via chatbot. So I suppose if you're using Slack, uh, you could uh, integrate that alert uh, there. Um, so nothing super exciting there. But yeah, so if you were using Slack or I'm sure it integrates with um, uh, AWS's version of Slack, which is called Chime. And there's probably another service uh, there. So uh, that's kind of interesting there. But we'll go ahead and we will confirm our budget. We're going to get an overview of that and we'll go ahead and create that budget. Okay. And so now we have this budget and we just have to uh, wait some time before we can uh, actually see some information here. But generally what would happen is it will, oh, here we go. I just did a refresh there. So it showed my budgeted, my forecasted, the current versus budgeted, and then the forecast. Okay. So yeah, there you go. That is AWS budgets. So I just wanted to show you that the uh, email here came through for AWS budgets and just what it looks like. Uh, so here you can see that it says um, th that I exceeded the amount of $80. So when we entered in that 80%, uh, it calculated the dollar amount for us there. Uh, it just shows us that information. Okay, so there you go. That's all you need to know for AWS budgets. Hey, this is Angie Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at the TCO calculator, um, which stands for the total cost of ownership. Uh, and this allows you to estimate how much you would save when moving to AWS from on-premise. So it provides you a detailed set of reports that can be used in executive presentations. The tool is built on underlying calculation models that generate fair assessments of value that you can achieve given the data provided, okay? And the TCO helps by reducing the need uh, need to invest in large capital expenditures. Of course, this tool is for approximation purposes only, so it's really a persuasion tool um, uh, to use uh, for um, at the executive level. Okay, but the idea is that you would just launch the TCO calculator. You describe your environment. You're going to get a three-year summary of cost comparisons, and then you can download uh, that uh, detailed report. Okay. All right, so uh, we're going to take a look at in this follow along the total cost of ownership calculator here. So just Google and find your way to the TCO calculator on AWS. Uh, when you arrive at this page, you know you're in the right place and you're going to be looking for uh, this uh, big yellow button. Now, it does take uh, sometimes uh, quite a bit of time for this to load. So I've already uh, clicked that button and have it open here on a new tab. OK, uh, and so you get here and the idea is you choose your currency. We're going to stay with US dollars. And you can choose uh, whether you're on a premise or co-location. We're going to say on-prem. And then you can decide whether they are physical servers or virtual machines. You can see some options there. And now you're going to go ahead and fill some stuff in here. Uh, so let's see if I can figure something out here that is a good example. So maybe you'd have a non-database server. So you have your web application. Okay. And let's say it is using, oops, uh, it is using the number of VMs you have six running. And uh, each have, I don't know, eight cores. And you're using, um, 
that's uh 1024 204 2048 uh amount of memory although that's gigabytes <laughs> That's too high. We'll just say eight gigabytes there. Okay, and we can choose uh, the hypervisor, uh, the OS there. I'm gonna add another row here and we'll choose a database this time. And we'll just say uh, Postgres here, okay. Uh, we'll say Postgres and maybe we don't have as many uh, Postgres servers running here. So we'll say two and we will say uh, four cores and we will say uh, four gigabytes of memory here and that's running on VMware. And then we can choose storage here. Uh, so we have some storage here. Um, I guess we could just put something in here. So we could say uh, we'd have 500 gigabytes, maybe 500 gigabytes of storage. Okay. And so now that we have all those things, we're going to go ahead and hit calculate the TCO. And we are just going to wait here for this report to generate. All right. All right, so after a little wait there, um, we can see this report has generated and we have a comparison between on-prem and AWS. And it's saying that we could save up to 78% uh, a year, uh, which would give us a total savings of $200,000 uh, over the course of three years, okay? So here we get a cost breakdown and we uh, get the total cost of ownership there. So we have the server, the storage, the network, and now we have this additional cost, which is IT labor, okay? Because uh, this is... Uh, in the case that you have on-prem, you're going to have to hire uh, IT to manage the infrastructure on AWS. It's it's taken care of for you, okay? So you're not paying for uh, that cost. And then it shows you your on-prem environment. Uh, and then it shows you the equivalent in AWS. So if you had, if this is what you're using, this is what you'd want to use on AWS, okay? And then down below, we have some additional information, okay? Uh, and then we have a cost breakdown. So it just compares uh, those breakdowns for you, okay? And then we got other things here like calculations. Oh boy, that's a lot of stuff. Um, methodology, um, okay? So a lot of stuff that you can use uh, within uh, a presentation to make the case to move to AWS, okay? And then up here, we can just download that report, okay? And that would download it as a PDF, all right? But uh, there you go. So that's the, the TCO calculator. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at AWS Landing Zone which helps enterprises quickly set up a secure AWS multi-account. Now I have enterprises in red there because if you read the marketing page, it doesn't say that it's for enterprises, but it definitely is because uh, from what I remember, it has a very expensive upfront cost, okay, which, but for enterprises would be a very little. So it's not gonna be for the small to medium sized startups, but the purpose of AWS Landing Zone is to provide you with a baseline environment to get started with multi-account architecture. So what does that mean? Well, the idea is that you have these uh, companies and uh, AWS recommends that you run in multi-account, but they don't know how best to, the, the company itself doesn't know how best to set up multi-account and make sure it's secure and 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 good for future growth. And so Landing Zone is basically uh, that uh, um, uh, set up for you, okay? And the way this all works is through AWS Account Vending Machine, also known as AVM, which automatically provisions and configures new accounts via a service catalog template. Uh, and uh, the way you're going to access these accounts is going to be using single sign-on, um, okay? And so the environments here are customizable to allow customers to implement their own account baselines through a landing zone configuration and update pipeline, okay? So now that we have an idea, let's go take a peek at the landing zone page. So here we are on the AWS Landing Zone marketing page. I just want to scroll down here for you so I can just show you that they have some architectural diagrams here to give you an idea what you are getting with Landing Zone. So here it says the solution includes four accounts. Uh, Add-on products can be deployed using AWS Service Catalog. So when you uh, get this, you're going to get four accounts. You're going to get uh, this uh, master account here. Uh, then you're going to have a shared service account, log archive account, and security account. So when you are setting up your AWS um, uh, uh, organizations, you should always have a login account and should also have a security account that are isolate from your other accounts because it's just good for, uh, for auditing purposes. Okay, and so AWS is giving you the best setup uh, possible by uh, doing that for you. All right, and so when you need additional accounts, then you use that account vending machine, okay? And so that account vending machine will just uh, create new accounts for you. Um, and so that's really all you need to know about a landing zone, that it is uh, giving you a, a, a baseline environment, and then it's going to allow you to add additional accounts that are going to be secure uh, uh, with a lot of other uh, good best practices uh, baked into them, okay?
Hey, this is Angie Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at Avis resource groups and tagging. So we got two different things here, but they are strongly related. Uh, so we need to learn them both at the same time. So tags are words or phrases that act as metadata for organizing your AWS resources. And then you have resource groups are a collection of resources that share one or more tags. Okay, and so the way you'd access those resource groups is there's a drop down right beside services where you get to create a group and manage your tags. Okay, so uh, the whole purpose of uh, resource groups is to help you organize and consolidate information based on your your project and the resources that you use. And resource groups can display details about a group of resources based on metrics, alarms, configuration settings. Okay, and at any time you can modify the settings of your resource groups to change. Uh, what a resources appear. Okay, so let's say you had a database, a server, um, and uh, maybe an S3 bucket, and you wanted to group them all together, you'd uh, give them all the same tag, and then you could put them in a resource group. Uh, and so uh, that's the concept there. Okay. So in this follow along here, uh, I'm going to uh, show you how to use resource groups and tagging. So we're gonna spin up a couple of servers, uh, give them some tags uh, and associate those to a resource group, see that they are in a group, and then we'll tear down those servers, okay? So what I want you to do is make your way to EC2. So we'll go up to services at the top here and type in EC2, okay? And we'll just make our way over to the EC2 console. So once we are here, uh, we'll have to go ahead and launch some instances. So let's press the big blue button, okay? And uh, now that we're in here, uh, we'll just choose Amazon Linux 2, okay? And uh, we'll stick with the micro tier because that is the free tier. Uh, and then we're just gonna set up two servers, okay? And we're going to go um, onto storage and pass onto storage onto tags. And we're gonna add a new tag and I'm gonna call it uh, project. I'm gonna say Terrorock. Nor, okay, Terrock Nor, and that is a Star Trek reference if you're wondering, okay. And uh, we don't have to worry about security groups. We'll have to review and launch. We're gonna hit launch here, and I'm going to drop down proceed without a key pair. We're not doing anything with these servers, just tagging them, okay. And so uh, they are launching. We're gonna go down to view instances in the right hand uh, side there, and then they are launching. I'm just gonna click on one of these, even though there's a loading thing, you can still click the checkbox. And we're gonna to go to tags here, just so we can see our tag. And then what I want you to do is drop uh, resource groups down here, and I'm just gonna create a new group. I'm gonna open a new tab to make my life a little bit easier here. And we'll just wait for this to load. Okay, and so uh, here uh, we are creating a new group and we need to choose our group type. So we have tag-based and cloud formation stack-based. So we're gonna be going with tag-based today, okay? And so then we have our grouping criteria. This is gonna determine uh, how things will be grouped. Uh, and so uh, we can choose a resource type, but we'll just leave it to all supported resource types, okay? So that allows it to be anything, EC2 or anything, okay? And we will need to supply our tag. So going back over here, I just wanna make sure it's 100% the same. So I'm just gonna copy and paste that there. So we got project. And then we have Terrorock Nor, okay? And I'm just gonna hit add. And so now we have our criteria set up. Uh, this is where we would see those uh, group uh, resources. We don't see any as of yet, okay? Uh, I'm just gonna click here to see what we'd see. Oh, sorry, so you hit that there and now those instances have been found. And also the volumes, the EBS volumes attached there also have the tag applied, it appears to be. So we actually have four resources and that's why. And so I'm just going to uh, type in Terrorock nor here okay and um uh, we have some optionals uh here to tag the actual group here uh that's not necessary we'll just hit create group okay and so now we have grouped resources okay so whenever we want to look at our saved groups okay we can go here we can see terak nor and we can see all the resources and then quickly cl uh, click through to find uh, the resources with those tags all right all right, and so now that we know how to create a resource group, let's actually go look at manage tags, okay? Because this is a very convenient way to uh, find resources, all right, based on tag. So what we can do is we are, it's certain, it adds the region that we're in, so we're in Ohio right now, uh, and we could choose the type of resource, I'll say all resource types, and I'm gonna just type in project, see how it auto-completes there, and I can choose Terok Nor, okay, I'm gonna hit add, I'm gonna hit search resources, okay? And so what that has done for me is it's actually uh, found them all for me. And if I want to export them as a CSV, uh, those resources, I could do so. 
Um, and I think if I checkbox here and go to manage tag selected resources, I can now uh, uh, remove the tag from all these resources here or add additional tags. Okay, so I can go here and then say um, uh, Federation Starfleet. Okay. All right, and I believe uh, if I hit review and apply tags, it's gonna go now apply those tags to those four resources. So we go back to EC2 instance here. Uh, we might have to do a manual refresh up here. And so now we have an additional tag applied. If we wanted to uh, remove those on mass, it's gonna be the same story, right? So we're gonna go to project. We're going to go to Tarak Nor. We're going to hit uh, all resources here, search for those resources, and I can select them all, manage them and remove that tag, okay? So um, yeah, and it's pretty darn straightforward. I think I actually removed our original tag there. So if I go back here and do a refresh, now we just have Federation Starfleet, okay? So, uh, you know, that's as simple as it is. Uh, and there's tagging found out th uh, throughout so many services within AWS, okay? And I'm just going to go and shut down these instances because we are done with them. So we want to terminate them and we want to say yes. Okay, and so that's all of our cleanup there. So there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at AWS Quick Starts, which are pre built templates by AWS Solution Architects uh, and AWS Partners to help you deploy popular stacks on AWS. And so the uh, benefit here is that it can reduce hundreds of manual uh, procedures into just a few steps, okay? So Quick Start is composed of three parts. So you're gonna get a reference architecture for the deployment. So that's gonna be like an architectural diagram and descriptions. And then the actual uh, Quick Start itself is just a CloudFormation template. And CloudFormation templates are used for provisioning multiple AWS resources. So it's gonna automate and configure that deployment for you. Uh, and it will have also a deployment guide explaining the architecture and implementation in detail, okay? So most Quick Starts are reference uh, reference deploy deployments enable you to spin up a fully functional architecture in less than an hour okay so you can get operational pretty quick with these things and on the right hand side there you can see that I've uh, cherry picked one out there from Anika and that's one uh, is for setting up an IOT camera connector okay so here I just want to give you a quick tour of AWS Quick Starts just so you have an idea of uh, what there is available to you here. And so on the left hand side, we have a bunch of filtration options to choose um, uh, or to narrow down uh, some uh, nice templates here for us. And on the right hand side, we already have some templates. So let's go into analytics here. And right away, we have a one here by Cambridge Technology, which um, automatically deploys a clickstream analytics environment for you. So that sounds pretty cool. So if we just click into uh, this actual uh, quick start here, uh, what we're going to see down below is that architectural diagram I was talking about, how uh, or like a uh, bunch of descriptions as to what it is doing. Uh, this stuff varies based on um, uh, uh, quick start templates. So don't expect to see the same stuff everywhere, but they'll generally give you instructions on how to deploy and then the costs or licenses involved. And so if we wanted to launch this, we go uh, view deployment guide details maybe here. Okay. And, uh, oh, we got a big white paper. So uh, this one's a bit different here. Sometimes the buttons are a little bit more clear. Um, oh yeah, here it is. So again, this will vary based on each one. So I've never done this one before, but we'll say deploy into a new VPC, okay? And what that's gonna do is um, set up that CloudFormation template for you. So that's what I'm expecting anyway. So yep, there it is. It's going into CloudFormation, okay? Uh, and we're not going to go through this whole process. I'm just showing you um, at least to this stage, okay? And so here we have that template. We go next. And I'm just going to see if it asks us to provide some information. So yeah, these a CloudFormation template has a bunch of variables that you'd fill in. So based on the quick start template you have, it's just going to have different options here. As you can see, this one has a variety of options. But we would just fill that in, uh, go next, review, and launch. And then it would spin up. Uh, that click stream for us. So there you go. That is um, uh, quick starts. Hey, this is Angie Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at AWS cost and usage report. Uh, and this is a service which will generate out a detailed spreadsheet, enabling you to better analyze and understand your AWS costs. So uh, just as it says, uh, you have a big button and you download a spreadsheet and there you get a nice big breakdown. Uh, the report uh, gets placed uh, in an S3 bucket. 
Uh, you can use Athena to turn that report into a queryable database, or, or you can use QuickSight to visualize your billing data as graphs. Okay, so you have a lot of options here to work uh, with this data. All right, but maybe you just want the spreadsheet. Okay, so that is Abus Cost Usage and Report. So in this follow along, I just wanna show you how to use AWS cost and usage report to get that spreadsheet, okay? And so what you're gonna do is you're gonna go up the top uh, right corner here, you're gonna go to my billing dashboard and you're gonna make your way to the cost and usage reports here on the left hand side, okay? And then once you get here, we're gonna have a nice big blue button that we can press uh, to create our reports. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're gonna need to give this a name. So we're gonna say my, uh, my uh, use cost and usage, okay? And uh, we can include additional resource IDs here. I'm gonna just hit next. Uh, and then we need to configure where it goes. So I'm gonna create a new bucket. So I'm just gonna say uh, exp for exam pro, uh, cost and usage, okay? And it's going to put that in the US East uh, one region there. Okay, we'll hit next. And then we have this nice big policy it wants. So we'll say save that, okay? And then we can choose uh, uh, to what detail that we want. Um, I'll leave it for hourly. That's totally, oh no, we'll say daily. That's uh, probably uh, more ideal there. Uh, we'll create a new version of the support. And now for easy integration, we do have uh, those options there, Athena, Redshift, and QuickSight. But we are just going to uh, uh, leave this at, as B. I'm gonna make a zip because I wanna make uh, my life really easy here. Uh, just because if I download to my local computer, I wanna be able to unzip that with uh, very little effort here. I'm gonna hit next. And uh, what we can do here is go hit review and complete. Okay, and so now um, it is uh, going to uh, deliver that. So in the next 24 hours, your, your first report will be delivered to an Amazon S3 bucket you configured during this report creation. So we're just gonna have to wait for this creation and I will come back here and download and show you um, uh, that report, okay? All right, so it's been 24 hours and I went over to my S3 uh, buckets here and I searched for that bucket that I created uh, and then I just drilled down. So if you just click uh, through to that bucket, okay, so I go into here and then uh, there's this folder that has no name, okay? And then you go into cost and usage and then you go into here. Then you're gonna see uh, another folder, you click into there and then we can get that CSV zip, okay? And so that's going to uh, have a zip which contains a CSV file and that's gonna give us that raw data, which I've opened up here in Excel. And so you can see there's a lot of data here. And so it's up to you to uh, make sense of this data, but at least you can see you get all the raw data from cost and usage. And of course, I mean, the huge advantage here is that you can integrate this into uh, QuickSight and Athena to analyze it within AWS, okay? Uh, so there you go, that is a cost and usage. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we're looking at organizations and accounts. So when you first sign up for AWS, you um, are creating a single account, and that first user you're logging in as is the root user, okay? So just look over here on this diagram, see where we have a master account. So just uh, let's pretend that this was the account that we created, and we are logging in as that root account user. So what you can do is you can promote your account into an organization, uh, and so what that, that's going to allow you to do is it's going to allow you to create multiple accounts within that organization. So now that original account is now a master account and underneath it, it you can create multiple accounts, okay? So why would you wanna do this? Well, if you're uh, uh, an organization, you might want to like uh, uh, isolate uh, different departments uh, within your company uh, and also to have fine-tuned control over what they have access to on mass, okay? So the idea here is like, let's say you have a development team on one side and there's multiple accounts, you can put them within an organizational unit and then use a service control policy to apply rules about what services they can and cannot use on mass, okay? So, I mean, that's pretty much all there is to it, but I think this will be a lot more clear when we do a quick follow along, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and in this follow along, I'm gonna show you how to use organizations uh, and create some member accounts, okay? So uh, there are two places where you can manage uh, your organization. Uh, it's within the IM console here. Uh, so you just type in IM to get to that console. 
Um, but you can see here that it says organization is not in use because we have yet to create an organization. So uh, what we'll have to do is uh, in a new tab, we'll have to go to the organizations um, uh, console here, which is uh, where I am at currently. And we have this nice little uh, wizard here to get started. So I'm gonna go ahead here and hit create organization. It's going to ask us to create an organization uh, where we have all these features, or we could just have one with consolidated billing. We definitely want to create uh, this one here. So I'm gonna hit create organization. Great, and so here I have created uh, an organization and you can see that it sent me an email to finish verifying your master account because uh, the uh, original account we have here has now been uh, turned into a master account. So I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, go confirm that email here. So now I'm in my email here and uh, here is that verification email. So I'm just gonna go ahead and press that button. And uh, now uh, this has been verified, okay? So I'm just gonna uh, close that here. And I'm just going to refresh and you can see we are now verified. Okay. And we can see that's our master account. I think it might be, yep. The star uh, emphasizes that that is a master account. So if I go back to IAM console here and do a refresh, let's see if there's any kind of change. Okay. And there definitely is. So you can see that we have a root uh, organization here, and then uh, we have the exam pro fresh account, which is the master account. So uh, we can't create additional accounts from here. It's just more of an organizational structure. But what we can do is go back to the organization's console here and uh, do some organize, uh, organizing. So before I actually go ahead and create any accounts, let's actually go look at uh, some, uh, some organizations. Uh, or sorry, to organize this account. So we'll go to organize accounts. And uh, so over here, this is where we'd see all of our accounts and we can create some organizational units. So I'm gonna create a new organizational unit called uh, developers, okay. And uh, so now I have uh, that organizational unit and uh, there is some way for me to uh, um, set them in the tree. Actually, by default, it has already set it here. Um, uh, so we already have that. Okay, so I suppose it already is uh, associated to the root there. Okay, and so now what we'll want to do is we'll want to actually um, uh, create uh, an account under uh, this organizational unit. So let's go back to accounts here and let's make a new account. And I'm gonna create uh, a new account here and I'm gonna do Andrew uh, plus fresh plus developer at exampro.co here, okay? All right, it's gotta be here. And we'll just say Andrew Brown, okay? Because every account has to have a unique, unique email uh, for the root account. Uh, and there is this IM role. I'm just going to leave that blank and hit create. And uh, what's that? Uh, what that is going to do? It's going to uh, get us set up with a new account. And so I'm just waiting here for uh, this to um, send us an email to tell us that our account is ready. Okay. So uh, we'll just wait here for a little bit. All right. So after waiting a few minutes here, I got a new email saying my account is ready. Okay. Uh, and just back in uh, here, uh, if you do a hard refresh here, uh, you'll see that the account is set up. You probably don't want to name the account based on someone's name. Um, I just uh, inherently had put my uh, name in there. Uh, generally, you'd want to name this developers or whatever uh, the account is called here. But this account is now ready. So how do we actually access this account? Uh, well, the way you do it is you actually just uh, log in as the root user. So I'm going to just close this tab here. And I need to remember what this email is here. So it's Andrew plus fresh plus developer. And we're just gonna log out here and um, uh, just uh, sign back in with this uh, as the root user. So what we'll do here is we'll just go ahead and go sign into console. And uh, we are just going to provide uh, that email there and we're just going to hit next. Okay, and what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna hit forgot password because this is the only way uh, to uh, set up new accounts. Um, you have to just reset the password. And so we have to enter in this code, 53YM, QQ, that's really hard to see, but I think that's what it is. Okay, we'll try this again. 87E8YP. Great, and so now we're gonna get uh, an email here, and so we'll just wait for that email, okay? All right, and so uh, here is that uh, email to reset our password. So we just gotta go ahead here and click uh, this link here, okay? And so now we're just gonna have to provide a new password. So I'm just going to fill something in there. Okay, and so now our password has been reset. Great, so now we'll just have to proceed to sign in here. So we'll just put in that new password and we should be in our new account. Great, and so now we are in with, uh, within this new account. So uh, it's that easy to uh, get new accounts set up. 
Um, and so I guess the next thing is we'll look at how we can organize this account with an organization. So we're gonna have to log in and go back into um, the root account of um, our master account, okay? So that's what I'm just doing here. Okay. So I believe I called it fresh. And we will just uh, supply that a password. Okay, and so uh, what we'll do here is we'll make our way over to organizations. And uh, we see we have our account there. And so what we want to do is we want to add our account uh, to an organizational unit. Uh, and so I'm just going to see how we can do that if I can remember how. Um, so I'm just going to check box this here. And I believe over here, if we right click here, um, this account is currently in the root. To move this, uh, choose the move account option. Okay, so I guess that's what we uh, need to do here. So we'll just click on move and we'll just choose that to be in the developer's root. And so now this account is under uh, the developer's organizational unit, okay? So if we click in there, we can see that account. So the reason you'd want to move things into organizational units is so you can attach policies, okay? And service control policies, and that's what they are, um, helps you limit access to certain resources. So if we only wanted that uh, account to uh, only be allowed to use EC2, that's what we can do. So we'd say only EC2 here as the policy name. Uh, and then we'll just filter out what it is that we want to allow. So we'll say EC2. Uh, and then we have to choose action, so we'll say all, okay? And then we can move on to uh, uh, resources, I suppose. Specify the resource type, uh, EC2. Uh, we'll say all resources here, and then we'll hit add. Um, and then we'll move on to the conditions. And so um, we don't need to change any of this here. I, I'm pretty sure I'm happy with that. Uh, and we're gonna say allow. So we're just gonna allow uh, access to all of EC2, um, okay? So that way everything else will be implicitly denied. So the only thing we'll have access to is EC2 and hopefully the statement is um, valid and we'll just go hit uh, create policy. And now that we have our policy created here, uh, which gives us only EC2 access, we now can apply it to that organization. You have to do everything from the root. Uh, so you'd have to enable uh, service control policies so that you're allowed to use them, okay? And so now that is enabled, and I believe uh, if we go into developers, we should be able to set that policy. So I'll go here, uh, and I'm gonna just choose attach, okay? Uh, and I'm not sure if I can detach it, but let's give it a go. Okay, and so now this one should only have access to uh, EC2, uh, and um, but the root will still have access to everything, okay? So um, uh, there we go. So now, that we have an idea how we can apply uh, permissions to accounts. Let's actually go back to the other account and just um, go ahead and uh, um, just uh, shut it down or terminate it because we're not gonna be using this other account for anything. We don't want to leave um, this other account uh, laying around, okay? So what we'll do is we will just uh, log out here and I'm just going to log back into this other account, okay? So I'm just proceeding to log into that other account there. Uh, and I just got to type the password in here. Okay, great. So we're back into our um, uh, member account there. Uh, and we did say we were only allowed to launch EC2. So actually, let's go ahead and uh, try to just create something else just to see if our uh, service control policy is working. And right away, you see you're not authorized to perform Lambda. So uh, our, our policy is working as expected, okay? And uh, I didn't mention this before, but every time you create an account, they all have their own root account, okay? So right now we are logged in as the root account into this member account. Uh, and let's say you want to get rid of this um, uh, account, you can actually suspend this account. So let's go ahead and do that now. So I believe to uh, suspend accounts, we have to go to up, uh, up here and we'll have to go to my account. All right, so, um, but there's only one problem here is the fact that we don't actually have the ability to close our own account because we don't have the permission. So we're gonna have to go back um, into our uh, master account and uh, give us uh, better permissions there. Uh, so we can actually go ahead and uh, get rid of this account. So I'm just gonna log out here. We're gonna go back into our uh, master account there. And we will make our way back to organizations here. And so you might think that you could just remove the account here, but the problem with that is that it would just leave the organization. And in order to leave the organization, you'd have to attach a new credit card and the account wouldn't be, would actually, wouldn't be deleted or suspended. You actually can't delete accounts in AWS. You can just suspend them, which makes sure uh, that uh, no resources are being billed for within those accounts anymore. And that's what we want to accomplish here. 
So we're going to go uh, back to our organization accounts here. We're going to click on developers and we're going to go to service policies and I'm going to uh, attach the full access and then detach only EC2. And we're going to log out and go back into um, that member account. All right, so here we are going back into that member account. Um, and we'll just do, uh, was it Andrew plus exam pro plus developers? Oh no, it's fresh. Okay. Fresh plus developers at exampro.co. Uh, maybe it's just developer. There we go. We'll enter that password in. Okay, great. And so now we should be able to, uh, get rid of our account here. So I'm going to go up and go to my account. Okay, and so we do have some sensitive uh, information here, uh, which I have uh, blocked out. Um, but within here, we are going to go ahead and close our account. Um, so we'll just do that. So what I did here is I just scrolled all the way to the bottom and you can see that we can close our account. Uh, and we have a big long disclaimer about it. Um, but again, the advantage here of closing our account, which just suspends it, is that it's going to uh, ensure that we are not being billed for anything else within our account. Okay, and I'm just going to go ahead here and say I, I understand for the three things here and go ahead and close my account. And so this account has now been closed and I can just proceed to uh, logging out here. So just scroll up and just uh, log out and we'll go back into our master account. All right, and so now we'll just go ahead and log back into our master account and go just check on the status of that organization. And we will just make our way back to organizations here. And um, you can see now this is suspended. So this account is no longer active. Okay. Um, and so that's all there is to it. Okay. So um, yeah, that's ABIS organizations. And yeah, there is some, uh, some um, visibility there on organizations within the uh, IM console. There's not a lot there to do. You can just see the structure and look at service control policies, but just be aware that AWS is developing that in IM. Uh, yeah, there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are going to learn a bit about AWS networking here. So I have this nice big architectural diagram and we're going to work our way through it. Okay. So the first thing you'll want to do when you want to launch resources is you're going to have to choose a region to launch them in. And so a region is a geographical location of your network. So that could be US East 1, which is North Virginia, or maybe you would choose Canada Central, which is based in Montreal. Once you've uh, decided what region you want to launch resources in, you're going to need a VPC. And uh, a VPC stands for Virtual Private Cloud. It is a logical isolated section of the AWS cloud where you can launch AWS resources. So it's just a slice uh, of the AWS network just for you, okay? And then once you have uh, uh, your VPC, you're gonna want to subdivide it up into subnets. Uh, and so subnets are a logical partition of IP network into multiple smaller network segments, okay? So you could have public and private subnets. The difference between a public and a private subnet, a public one is uh, generally accessible to the internet, whereas a private subnet is where it is not, okay? So when you have things that need to be super secure, uh, you're gonna put those in a private subnet, all right? Uh, and so subnets um, are defined within an availability zone and an availability zone uh, is just a data center for your uh, for where you're going to launch your AWS resources. And those AZs are contained or are specific to uh, specific regions, okay? So uh, now we have a region, we have a VPC, we have our subnets. Um, and so we can uh, go ahead and start launching uh, resources into our subnets here. So we could launch an EC2 instance or an RDS instance, but how, are, uh, how is that uh, EC2 instance going to reach the internet? So in order to do so, uh, we're gonna need um, a gateway to the internet and that's where internet gateway comes into play. So it enables access to the internet. You can think of it as a door to the internet uh, uh, from your VPC uh, outward, okay? Um, but just having internet gateway is not enough because the subnet has to know how to reach that internet gateway to reach the internet. And that's where route tables come in. So route tables determine where network traffic from your subnets are are directed. So you would create a, a, um, a route in your route table to say, hey, route table, go here and go out to the internet, all right? Uh, now that we uh, have a way to the internet and we can launch uh, uh, resources um, into our subnets, uh, what about security? And that's where security groups and knackles are going to come in. So security groups is uh, access a firewall um, 
at the instance level. So here you can see that we have an EC2 instance in RDS and they span subnets and we have a, a border drawn around it to say that the security group is protecting those uh, two instances. So that's how that works. And you have knackles and knackles is another form of security, but it's at the subnet level. So it sits in front of subnets and controls access in and out of those, okay? So, I mean, those are the most important components of AWS networking. Uh, there's definitely a lot more, but that's all we need to know for now, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and we are looking at database services. Uh, and so you can see we have a variety of different services uh, for databases on AWS. Uh, and for the actual exam, you probably just need to know DynamoDB, RDS, Aurora, and Redshift. Um, but when you're taking the exam, they might throw in these other ones to just throw you off. And so by knowing all of them through process of elimination, you can determine what the correct answer is, okay? So I think it's going to be good for us to learn them all. Uh, and so just starting at the top here with DynamoDB, which is a NoSQL key value database. Uh, and so I always like to say that it's Cassandra-like or Cassandra-based, uh, because I think at one point it was, or at least it is very similar to it. And so uh, this is a very flat and simple database, which can scale to millions of records and will give you a guarantee of read and writes per second, okay? So if you needed to say 200 reads uh, per second, you just enter that in and you'd get a guarantee of it, all right? Uh, moving on to DocumentDB, which is a NoSQL document uh, database uh, that is MongoDB compatible. So if you need MongoDB, you're going to be using DocumentDB. Then we have RDS, which stands for the Relational Database Service, okay? And it's probably the most popular um, uh, database on AWS and the most commonly used, and it supports multiple engines. So you can use MySQL, Postgres, MariaDB, Oracle, or Microsoft SQL Server, all right? And it happens to have uh, one other engine called Aurora. And so Aurora is really its own thing. And it is a fully managed relational database, okay? And within it, uh, you can choose uh, to either run MySQL or Postgres. And so because it's fully managed, uh, it has a greater performance over the regular uh, MySQL Postgres RDS. And you're gonna see MySQL, it has a, uh, a better performance of up to five times, whereas Postgres has up to three times. Now Aurora, again, is highly available and durable. And so uh, when, it, uh, when you spin up an Aurora cluster, it's going to be running um, six copies of your database across three availability zones. Okay, so uh, with that, um, it definitely is uh, more expensive uh, than using RDS. But if you are an enterprise or you need that guarantee of um, availability and durability, you're definitely going to want to use Aurora. Uh, now, moving on to Aurora Serverless, it's pretty much the same thing as Aurora uh, with uh, uh, less features. Uh, but the huge advantage here is that um, it's, it's way more inexpensive. So this is kind of like a relational database where it's on a need be basis, okay? So the idea is that you're only paying for um, when you're using it, just like kind of like a Lambda, okay? Uh, and it's really good for development workloads or web apps that are not, not frequently used um, or if you're using a serverless architecture, okay? So it makes it really easy to uh, connect Lambdas to Aurora serverless. Now, moving on to Neptune, it is a managed graph database. That's all you need to know. Uh, then we're on to a Redshift. So Redshift is a columnar store database, okay? So instead of reading via rows, it reads via columns. And so it's really, really good um, uh, working with uh, uh, a, a huge amount of data where you need to uh, generate maybe um, an, uh, like reports or analytics, like a business intelligence tool, and it can handle petabytes worth of data, okay? So... Uh, there's like a thousand terabytes in one petabyte. So that is a significant amount of data. Moving on to ElastiCache, um, it is a caching solution. So you can either choose to use uh, the open source um, uh, caching uh, databases here, uh, uh, Redis or a memcache, okay? So if you need caching, that's gonna be uh, your choices here. So there you go, that's all the uh, database services. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro and we are looking at provisioning. And so provisioning is just an easy way to uh, set up a bunch of uh, AWS resources for you or your servers in an automated way. And this could be done via code or it could be done via 
uh, a graphical user interface, okay? And so AWS has uh, a variety of different services that can help us with provisioning. So let's just learn the difference between all these services, starting with Elastic Beanstalk. So Elastic Beanstalk is really good at deploying web applications where you don't have to uh, think about the underlying infrastructure at all. So what you're gonna do is you're just gonna prepare your code, you're gonna upload it uh, to Elastic Beanstalk, choose um, the uh, container you want to use uh, with the language of choice, and it will more or less work with very little to no configuration. So if you're using Ruby on Rails, you just choose the Ruby container, upload your code and it would work. Uh, and you know, if you wanted to use um, uh, Django, then you just choose the Python container, et cetera, et cetera, okay? I like to think of Elastic Beanstalk as the Heroku for AWS. So if you've ever used Heroku, uh, it's just a, a service where you, um, not part of AWS, but you just um, uh, upload your code and it just works, okay? Moving on to OpsWorks. OpsWorks uh, is a configuration management service and uh, it's going to uh, help you uh, uh, the management uh, help you with the configuration of your instances uh, using either Chef or Puppet. So uh, those are uh, just two different um, tool, uh, developer tools that you can use to uh, manually, or sorry, programmatically set up a server. So for uh, uh, for Chef, you're actually using uh, Ruby. Uh, that's what it's written in. And uh, so you would define these things called recipes. Uh, and those recipes would uh, go out and set up things on your actual EC2 server. So if you had to install um, uh, dependencies or pull the code or do a bunch of other stuff, uh, that's what those tools are going to do. And OpsWorks also has uh, a concept called layers. So you can uh, uh, define your infrastructure as uh, like three tier or two tier layers. Um, and uh, so you could have like an application layer, a database layer, a networking layer, and it just makes things very clear, okay? Uh, moving on to CloudFormation. CloudFormation uh, is infrastructure as code. And so the idea here is that you are um, uh, creating a JSON or a YAML file. And what you're going to do is you're going to define all of your uh, AWS resources uh, that you want to provision and how exactly how you want to configure them. And you're going to upload that template and then it's going to set everything up for you in one go. Okay, so CloudFormation is an extremely um, powerful uh, provisioning tool. Um, and so uh, compared to OpsWorks, OpsWorks uh, has uh, some limitations as to what it can do. Uh, so it can uh, set up uh, some things for you, but CloudFormation can do anything pretty much in AWS, okay? So it is the most complex option, but it is also, is also the most uh, flexible option in our provisioning tool set here. Moving on to AWS Quick Starts, these are just pre-made packages, which actually are just CloudFormation templates, and they are created by AWS or uh, uh, with AWS third-party uh, providers uh, through the APN uh, network, okay? And so... Uh, they are going to have these prepackaged uh, templates for a variety of different things. And um, we do cover quick si or quick start uh, in more detail here uh, in this course. But the idea is like, let's say you wanted to get started with ML, you'd go to the ML category and there would be a bunch of pre-made uh, 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 CloudFormation templates and you just launch one, okay? So you'd have to uh, take a look to see what there is there, but it is a provisioning tool. Moving on to AWS Marketplace. This is a digital catalog of thousands of software listings from independent software vendors where you can find, buy, test, and deploy software. Okay, and so um, generally uh, you're gonna be using the Marketplace to uh, uh, buy managed EC2 uh, instances. So let's say you needed to set up a WordPress, you could go into the AWS Marketplace and find an AMI uh, for WordPress. So one uh, that is very popular is by Bitnami. And so the advantage here is that it's just pre-configured for you and maybe it has additional uh, security hardening. And so you would pay a monthly subscription to use that, okay? So those are all of our provisioning options on Ooh. AWS. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at computing services on AWS, starting with EC2, which stands for Elastic Compute Cloud. And you can see that I've made a division there, and that's just to emphasize how important EC2 is. Uh, and the fact that basically every service under the hood is using EC2. So no matter what you're using, whether it's a Lambda, RDS, or Redshift, 
they're all running on EC2 instances. They just uh, will, might be abstracted away from you because AWS is managing those EC2 instances, okay? And so what is EC2? Well, it's a highly configurable server uh, where you get to choose your CPU, memory, network, and operating system, okay? So now moving on to the other computing services, we have ECS, which stands for Elastic Container Service. Uh, and this is basically Docker as a service. So if you need to run microservices or a uh, a Dockerized application, you're going to be launching it on ECS. So with ECS, what you would do is you would just choose the type of EC2 instance you, you want, and that EC2 instance will uh, come pre-configured with uh, Docker running on it. And then it has a really nice interface so that you would just um, define uh, your containers within something called a task or a service, and then you would just um, uh, run them on ECS, okay? Next on this list, you have Fargate, and this is also for microservices, and this is kind of like the evolution of ECS. So with ECS, you choose what EC2 instance uh, you uh, you need to use. Fargate, you uh, don't choose the EC2 instance, you just would um, uh, define your, uh, your containers within a task or a service, and you would just um, uh, tell them to run, and AWS would just have it run, okay? And so the difference here is that you aren't paying for the EC2 instance, you're just paying for the runtime and the CPU utilized, okay? So it's kind of like um, lambdas where you're just paying for the time performed and the resources used, okay? Uh, moving on to EKS, which is K Kubernetes as a service. Uh, and so if you've never heard of Kubernetes, it's becoming the de facto standard for microservices uh, within the industry. And so since it's uh, so important, AWS has decided uh, that it needs to have a service to run um, uh, Kubernetes and it's called EKS, okay? So it gives you all the benefits of ECS, uh, but allows you to run the open source Kubernetes, okay? And again, this is just for uh, microservices. Moving on to Lambda, Lambda uh, lets you run serverless functions. Uh, so the idea here is that it, you just upload your code in the form of function uh, and it just runs. You don't have to think about the servers. There's nothing to provision. Everything is taken care of for you. Uh, and you are just paying for the compute time uh, based on how long it runs, okay? So that's all there is uh, uh, with Lambda. Okay, and then moving on to Elastic Beanstalk. And so Elastic Beanstalk is going to orchestrate a various amounts of AWS services for you. So the idea is it will set up EC2, S3, SNS, CloudWatch, RDS, load balancers, whatever you need to run your web application. And uh, the idea behind Elastic Beanstalk, it allows you to uh, uh, set up developer environments. That's what it's intended for. It's not really for production use, but the idea is like, let's say you're a developer and you have a web app and it's running on Ruby on Rails or Django or Laravel, and you just want to get it running, uh, but you don't want to have to think about all the services you have to set up. Uh, you just uh, upload your code to Elastic Beanstalk. It would do the rest for you. Uh, uh, so uh, that's all there is there uh, to that service. And it really just is using EC2 again. So it's just going to set up EC2 instances for you, but you just don't have to worry about it. Moving on to AWS Batch. So AWS Batch, um, as the name implies, for batch processing. So you can plan, schedule, and execute your batch computing workloads across the full range of AWS compute services and features. And so what it's doing is it's just uh, launching EC2 uh, instances for you using spot pricing so that you can save a lot of money. So there you go. That is all the computing services you need to know. Hey, this is Andrew Brown at Exam Pro, and on AWS, we have a variety of different storage services that are available to us, so let's quickly go through them. So the first one on our list here is S3, which stands for Simple Storage Service, and it's an object store. I like to think of it as a hard drive in the cloud where I don't have to think about the actual hard drive. I can just upload files and I don't have to worry about running out of space because there's unlimited space. So it really is a no brainer, okay? And then you have S3 Glacier. And so it's like S3, but it's extremely inexpensive. But the trade-off here is that you have to be okay with waiting uh, for several minutes, up to hours to access those files. And when you do access those files, there is a retrieval cost. Uh, so it is a really good use case for uh, large enterprises who have lots of sensitive data, but they have to hold on to it for seven to 10 years, but they're very unlikely to actually ever look at uh, that data, okay? So that's where S3 Glacier comes in. Then you have Storage Gateway. And so I like to think of Storage Gateway as an extension of your on-premise storage into the cloud. Uh, you could also use uh, Storage Gateway as a backup solution. So for your local storage, you would just uh, back it up uh, onto S3 there. 
Okay, and so uh, basically storage gateway is a hybrid solution uh, for on-prem to cloud for storage. And then you have EBS, which stands for Elastic Block Store. And this is essentially a virtual hard drive in the cloud that you can attach to EC2 instances. And you get to choose what kind of hard drive you want it to be, okay? So if you want it to be a solid state drive, which are optimized uh, for higher IOPS and better throughput, uh, or you could use um, an HHD, which is going to uh, be more inexpensive solution, okay? And then you have EFS, which stands for Elastic File Store, and it is a file storage solution. So it's like having a file system that you're able to mount to multiple EC2 instances at the same time. Whereas with Elastic Block Store, you're only able to attach that to one EC2. Um, so uh, that is a huge advantage there, okay? All right, and so now we're looking at Snowball, and it is a way of moving a lot of data around uh, very quickly from your on-premise uh, network into AWS or vice versa. So let's say you have terabytes worth of data. Uploading that uh, directly to AWS would be extremely uh, slow and painful. So uh, what AWS will do is you order a Snowball, they'll send it to you. It's basically a computer in the form of a suitcase with a lot of hard drives in it. And uh, what you're going to do is you're going to quickly uh, load your data onto uh, that Snowball, and then it's going to be delivered to AWS uh, directly into S3, okay? Uh, and then uh, we have Snowball Edge, which uh, happens just to be like a Snowball with additional features uh, and more storage. So it actually can um, also process uh, data uh, 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 as it's being inserted into the snowball, okay? Uh, and then uh, last on our list here is Snowmobile, which is super cool, and it allows you to move petabytes worth of data. So it's actually just a giant cargo container uh, or a shipping container on a semi-trailer truck, okay? So it's basically like a data center on wheels. So um, uh, AWS will uh, drive it to your on-premise uh, um, location, and you're gonna basically just uh, hook up to that, um, and you're going to move all of your data onto there, and then it's gonna be driven back um, to AWS and then loaded into S3. So there you go, that uh, is the storage um, services on AWS. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at business-centric services. So starting at the top of our list here, we have Amazon Connect, which is a cloud-based call center service you can set up in just a few clicks and based on the same proven system used by Amazon customer service teams, okay? So it, what you can do with uh, Amazon Connect is uh, you can accept inbound, inbound calls and uh, dial outbound. You can record uh, your calls and then store them into S3. So maybe you could then run them uh, for analysis, maybe through uh, uh, Amazon Comprehend or something like that. Um, and you can also set up workflows within Amazon Connect. So if you want to route a call based on a set of rules, you can definitely do that there. Next on our list here is Workspaces, which just boils down to being a virtual remote desktop. So secure managed services for provisioning either Windows or Linux desktops in just a few minutes, which quickly scales up to thousands of desktops. So you just would uh, ha bring your own license and you'd be able to spin up a Windows 10 server that you can now log in uh, from uh, the convenience of your AWS account Okay, then we have WorkDocs, which is a content creation collaboration service. Easily create, edit, and share content saved centrally in AWS. So this is AWS's version of SharePoint. Then you have Chime. So this is AWS platform for online meetings, uh, video conferencing, and business call, uh, business calling, which elastically scales to meet your capacity needs. So Chime here is like uh, it's like having Slack and also um, Skype. Okay. Now we're on to WorkMail, and this is just managed business emails, contacts, and calendar service, which supports for existing desktop and mobile email client applications. So this is just Gmail for, uh, but like on AWS. Then you have Pinpoint. So um, this is for marketing campaign management systems. You can use for sending targeted emails, SMS, push notifications, and voice messages. So we actually use uh, Pinpoint here at Exam Pro to send out our campaign emails. So here you can import uh, a bunch of contacts, uh, create campaigns, uh, and do like A to B testing on your your emails. 
Okay, so uh, that's a useful tool there. Uh, then you have uh, SES, Simple uh, Email Service. And this is a cloud-based email sending service designated for um, marketers and application developers who send marketing notification and emails. So we just had mentioned Pinpoint, which is for marketing campaign management system. Uh, and this can send emails. But SES is more for like when you are building your web application and you want to send out emails from that application. So let's say you had someone who registered on your platform and you want to send them a confirmation email, you'd send them out through SES. And SES supports uh, HTML emails. So there's another service called SNS, which also can send emails, but that can only send plain text. So uh, that's why SES is more designed for marketers because it has that HTML component. And last on our list is QuickSight. And this is a business intelligence service. Uh, and so the idea here is you can connect multiple data sources and quickly visualize data in the form of graphs with little to no programming knowledge. Okay, so you could connect a data from S3, your uh, probably Aurora and RDS, uh, and you just click it. And then uh, with a bunch of uh, other clicks, you now have these beautiful graphs. Okay, and I believe that there's also like an ML component in QuickSight. So there's a lot of cool things you can do there. And you can also share um, those uh, visualizations in the form of dashboards uh, to uh, other people. Okay, so there you go. Those are the business centric services. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at enterprise integration. So this is all about going hybrid, bringing uh, your on-prem and your AWS network together, okay? So uh, the first service we're gonna look at here is Direct Connect, and this is a dedicated a gigabit network connection from your on-premise to AWS. So imagine having a direct fiber optic cable running straight to AWS. So it's a really good way of having low latency uh, and a dedicated connection, okay? Uh, the next thing is a VPN. So uh, the idea here is that it can establish a secure connection to your AWS network. Uh, and we have two ways of doing this. We have site-to-site -site VPN and client VPN. So site-to-site -site is when you are connecting on-prem to your network. And then you have client VPN. So imagine you have someone that works for you. Uh, maybe they Or maybe they work from home and they have a laptop and you just want to connect them to your network. Okay. Then you have Storage Gateway. So this is a hybrid storage uh, service that enables your on-prem uh, applications to use AWS uh, Cloud Storage. I always think of it as uh, extending your, uh, your on-prem hard drives onto AWS. So this can be also used for um, backing up and archiving, disaster recovery, uh, cloud data processing, storage tiering, and migration, okay? Uh, and then down below, we have Active Directory. So um, uh, we have AWS uh, Directory Service for Microsoft Active Directory, also known as AWS Managed Microsoft AD. And this enables uh, your directoryware workloads and AWS resources to use Managed Active Directory in the AWS Cloud. All right, so I know that last one was pretty boring, but uh, if you are using Active Directory, uh, there are definitely ways to integrate that on AWS. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at two logging services here. We have CloudTrail and CloudWatch, starting with CloudTrail. It logs all API calls, uh, generally via the SDK or AWS CLI between AWS services. So this is a really good service to determine who we should blame for something. So if you wanted to say who created this bucket, who spun up that expensive EC2 instance, who launched the SageMaker notebook, that's where CloudTrail is going to come into play. Uh, and so uh, some of the other use cases here is that we can use it to detect uh, developer misconfiguration, which we just talked about. Uh, but we could also use it to detect malicious actors. So if someone got into our account, uh, CloudTrail is going to uh, maybe give us um, an idea um, what is going on. And then we could also automate responses. So maybe every time someone created a bucket, you wanted to um, uh, trigger something. Um, and so that uh, is something that we could do maybe with uh, CloudWatch events uh, using CloudTrail. Okay. Uh, so now on to CloudWatch. So CloudWatch is a collection of multiple services, but generally when people say CloudWatch, we're talking about CloudWatch logs and all the other CloudWatch services are really based off of logs, okay? So CloudWatch logs is just a, a durable uh, uh, storage solution uh, for your uh, logs. And so logs could be performance data about your AWS services, such as CPU utilization, memory, or network in. Um, you could also store your application logs here. So if you are running Ruby on Rails, you could send the logs there or Nginx. 
uh, uh, just as that as well. Or let's say you're using Lambda. Lambda, you would uh, you can put within your functions a lot of console log calls. And so that would uh, then uh, uh, pass that on to uh, CloudWatch. And that is just in itself application logs for Lambdas. Okay, and so uh, moving on to the other CloudWatch uh, services, we have metrics and they represent a time ordered set of data points. And so you wanna think of CloudWatch metrics as a variable to monitor. And if that's so confusing, just think of it as like taking uh, data from CloudWatch logs and turning it into a graph, okay? Then you have a CloudWatch events and this allows you to trigger an event um, uh, based on a condition. So when, uh, when you have uh, log data, uh, or uh, you can uh, trigger it based off of a metric um, or, or other, other kind of rules. But like the most common thing you might use CloudWatch events for is let's say uh, every hour you want to take a snapshot of your um, Elastic Block store, the, like the volume that um, is attached to your server. You can do that with CloudWatch events. Then you have CloudWatch alarms and these trigger notifications based on a metric. And so um, you would specify a threshold and when that threshold is breached, that alarm gets triggered and then it would send you uh, an email or a text message, however you specify, okay? Uh, then you have CloudWatch dashboards and this just creates visualizations based off a of metric. So when I said earlier that metrics, um, you could think of them as um, graphs, that's exactly what they are. And so uh, you could take those uh, graphs and then put them onto a dashboard so you could represent a lot of data at a glance. So there you go. Those are the two uh, logging services in AWS. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at Know Your Initialisms. And so there's a lot of AWS services and some other things that are represented by um, the short form of initials. And the reason why it's good to know these uh, is that on the exam, uh, if they were to just give you the full name of the service, it might give away the answer. So they might use the initialized version. Okay, so if you had a question about sending emails and one of the options was SCS and you knew the E stood for email, that's a dead giveaway of what the correct answer is. Um, it's also just gonna help you uh, comprehend things a lot faster if every time you see auto scaling groups, you just think ASG because in your mind, you're gonna read that a lot quicker, okay? So we do have a lot of initialisms here um, and uh, for services, but there's also some things such as TAM, which is actually a uh, type of person that gets assigned to your account, or we have IoT, which is just a more uh, generic te te uh, a technology term, which stands for Internet of Things, okay? so. There just are a lot of uh, things on here, and these are the most common ones that I could think of. And so I figured, you know, you should uh, study up on these and just make sure you are familiar with them, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at the shared responsibility model, and this is gonna deal with security of and in the cloud. So when we're talking about customers, they are responsible uh, for security in the cloud. So what does that mean? Well, whatever data that you put on AWS, you are responsible for it. So if you do not secure it, that is your fault. Um, or if you do not uh, turn on monitoring services to monitor sensitive data, that's gonna be your fault as well. Uh, or there's a variety of different AWS services that you can use and it's up to you to configure them. So if there is a misconfiguration, that fault is gonna be uh, with you, okay? So those are your responsibilities. Uh, then we have AWS and so AWS is, has, is responsible for the security of the cloud. So the hardware, the operations of managed services and the global infrastructure, okay? So all the things that you can't touch is what AWS is responsible for. Uh, and so this is actually just a pared down version of the shared responsibility model. The full one uh, actually looks like this, okay? And so you can just see that there's a lot more information here. So for the customer, we got customer data, platforms, application, IAM, OS, the network, the fire configuration, client side data encryption, server side encryption, network tra uh, traffic uh, protection. And then on AWS, we have the software and hardware, right? So for the software, you have your compute, your storage, your database, your networking. And for your hardware, you have, um, and the AWS global infrastructure, you have the regions, the AZs, and the edge locations. Okay, so, I mean, this is the full list, but really, um, you just need to remember Again, for the customer, it's data and configuration. For AWS, it's global infrastructure and hardware, okay? Ooh. 
Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at AWS Compliance Program. So what is a compliance program? It's a set of internal policies and procedures of a company to comply with laws, rules, and regulations, or to uphold business reputation, okay? And so we have a bunch of these uh, cool looking badges. And the idea here is that if you need to conform to one of these compliance programs, uh, AWS has a big list of them. Uh, so it makes it easier for you to adopt cloud computing. Uh, two that I want to point out is HIPAA and PCI. Uh, so, so for HIPAA, that is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of the United States, and is a, a legislation that provides data uh, privacy and security provisions for safeguarding medical information. So if you're a hospital, you're going to want to be uh, HIPAA compliant, okay? And then you have uh, uh, PCI DSS, and so this is the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard. So when you want to sell things online and you need to handle uh, credit card information, you're going to want to be PCI compliant, okay? Okay. And there's a variety uh, of compliance programs. This is not the full list, uh, but just to give you uh, a taste of what that is. Okay. All right. So I just hopped over here to the AWS website because I just wanted to show you um, the full uh, range of compliance programs that AWS has. And if you had to find out if, if they had some kind of compliance program, uh, how to investigate that. So uh, here I am, and you can see we have a bunch of different logos, more than what I was showing you uh, prior there. Uh, and you can see that there are offerings uh, in multiple countries. So if we just scroll down here, you can see there's a lot for the US. Uh, we even have some here for Canada, okay, which is where I am, uh, Asia Pacific, Europe, Okay, so there is a variety of uh, things there. All right. Now, if you wanted to find a little bit more about any of these certifications, if you just click into them, they'll tell you uh, what it's for uh, uh, and a lot of additional information. Okay. So uh, there is um, a considerable amount of information here. So when you do need to explore a bit more about compliance programs, definitely check this out. Now, actually getting access to uh, the reports for how AWS uh, meets those compliances is another story. And so that's what we're going to look at next, which is AWS Artifact. Okay. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at AWS Artifact. And the purpose of this service is to really help us determine whether AWS is meeting uh, a compliance program, because just because they have uh, the logo on their website uh, doesn't necessarily mean that they are compliant. You need to prove that uh, via a very long checklist and explaining how you are meeting those uh, uh, all those rules within a compliance program. So if you wanted to get access to that, um, you actually have to go in a bit of a roundabout way. And so AWS has made a service in order to generate out uh, the report that shows that they're compliant. So what you do is you would go into AWS Artifact, you would choose the package uh, or artifact you're looking uh, to get. It's going to generate out a PDF. And then within that PDF, you have to click a link, which will then get you the actual files that you uh, that you are seeking, okay? So that's what AWS Artifact is. And I'm gonna show you um, how to uh, generate out an artifact and get to those files. All right, so in this follow along here, I'm gonna show you how to use AWS Artifact so that you can get access to a compliance report. So what I want you to do is go to the top here to services and we will type in Artifact. Uh, if I can remember how to spell it here, um, we just type in Art, there we go. And so now in Artifact, we're gonna get a huge list of all the possible compliance programs that AWS uh, uh, has. And so what we'll do is we'll just look for one. So since I'm in Canada, let's look for the, the Canada GC partner package. And what you'll do is you'll hit get this artifact, okay? And you'll be presented with a bunch of information. And what we'll do is you should probably read it. And then once you've read it, uh, check that box there and say accept and download. And what that what's that? that is going to do is it's going to download uh, this uh, PDF document. So in order for you to uh, um, access the files within this PDF, you're going to have to make sure you have Adobe Acrobat Reader installed because it will not work with any other reader. If you're on a Mac like I am on uh, right now, if you open it up in preview, it's not going to uh, allow you to download those files. But I'm gonna open up Adobe Acrobat and we're gonna give this a go. All right, so I have this document uh, uh, opened up here in Adobe uh, Acrobat or Reader, uh, and it even tells you right off the bat, open the artifact using Adobe Acrobat Reader. 
uh, other PDF readers are not supported, okay? Um, so now that we have this open, what we have to do is follow the instructions. So it says click the paper clip, uh, paper clip icon in the top left corner, so which is up here. Okay, and then uh, what it's going to tell you is a double click the file you'd like to open. So there could be a variety of different files in here. It could be PDFs or CSVs or Excels, but we'll just go ahead and uh, just double click this one here. And so now we actually have access to even more content. So now we have an XLS. So here, uh, I guess it's just kind of a, a summary of what's going on. Um, and then uh, within this XLS file is the file that we're actually trying to get to. So we're going to go ahead and open this file. Okay, and uh, here's that file open there. And so, uh, you know, this is what we're looking for. You can see it's a very long file. Okay, so um, the, these documents are going to vary based on each uh, compliance program because they're all different. But this is that one. And this is the file that you are trying to get to that proves that AWS is meeting uh, this compliance program. So there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at Amazon Inspector. And the question we are asking here is, how do we prove an EC2 instance is hardened? And so uh, to really understand that question, we need to know what a hardening is. And so hardening is the act of eliminating as many security risks as possible. Okay, uh, and so that is what AWS Inspector is helping you do. So AWS Inspector runs a security benchmark against specific EC2 instances. So you choose which ones you want, and you can run a variety of security benchmarks. Okay, and so uh, it can run both uh, a network and host assessment. So for a network, it's checking to see if uh, your uh, if any ports are open and if they're reachable to the internet. Uh, and then the host is actually uh, checking the actual OS um, and any of the applications there uh, based on the benchmark or security best practices that you choose, okay? So the way Inspector works is that it's gonna install the AWS agent on your EC2 instance, which it just does this, uh, I believe, through a run command. Uh, then it's gonna run an assessment for your assessment target. Uh, and then it's gonna, then you get to review your findings and uh, remediate uh, those security issues, okay? And so one very popular uh, security benchmark is the CIS, which stands for Center of Internet Security. Uh, and they have over 699 checks, and that's what we are going to be using uh, uh, through our follow along. So uh, let's get to that. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at AWS WAF, which stands for Web Application Firewall, and it's going to protect us. Uh, or, or specifically our web application from common web exploits, okay? So the idea here is you're gonna write your own rules that are either going to allow or deny traffic based on the contents of an HTTP request. Uh, and if you didn't wanna create your own rules and you wanted to just use one from a trusted AWS security partner, you could purchase uh, one very uh, cheaply in the AWS WAF rules marketplace. And so they call it a rule set because it's a bunch of rules included. Uh, and generally, uh, those rule sets will protect you against the OWASP top 10, which are the most dangerous attacks for web applications. Uh, and so uh, whether it's SQL injection or uh, cross-site scripting or a, a host of other ones, uh, again, those rule sets are easy to purchase and protect you against everything. Now, in order to use uh, WAF, it has to be attached either in front of CloudFront or an application load balancer. Uh, uh, and so there you go. That is all you need to know for AWS WAF. Hey, this is Angie Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at AWS Shield, which is a managed DDoS uh, protection service that safeguards applications running on AWS. So uh, just to understand uh, what the offering for the service is, we need to know what a DDoS attack is, which stands for Distributed Denial of Service. And this is a malicious attempt to disrupt normal traffic by flooding a website with a large amount of fake traffic, okay? Uh, and so um, in order to use uh, AWS Shield, it's actually already turned on for you um, and it's given uh, to all AWS customers uh, at no additional charge, at least the Shield standard is. And so uh, in order to take advantage of Shield, you just have to make sure that you are routing your traffic through Route 53 or through CloudFront, okay? Uh, now, I said uh, that there is a paid tier and that is Shield Advanced, okay? So for Shield uh, Standard, 
Uh, this is going to protect you against the most common DDoS attacks, and it's already turned on automatically for you, uh, and it's available for a lot of different AWS services. Uh, and then you have a uh, Shield Advance, which costs three thousand dollars per year, and you have to pay that uh, uh, upfront, I believe, or at least you have to make a commitment to pay that. Um, and this is going to protect you against uh, additional um, types of attacks, larger attacks, more sophisticated attacks. Okay, and it's also going to give you visibility into those attacks. So I believe you get like a dashboard, and you also get twenty four seven access to some DDoS experts for those complex cases. I myself have experienced DDoS and have paid for um, such a service as uh, Shield Advance, so I can definitely understand the value there. Uh, and it's only available for a limited amount of services, so it'd be for Route 53, CloudFront, uh, ELB there, a Global Accelerator, um, F, and putting things uh, in front of or onto an EIP there. Okay, so um, that's all there is there. And I probably will just go to the website and just pull up the big comparison so we can take a quick look through it. All right, so I've hopped over here to the AWS website to give you a comparison between Shield Standard and Shield Advanced. And so uh, as we saw earlier, Shield Standard is turned on for all AWS services where Shield Advance, uh, it's gonna have the same coverages uh, of standard, but have uh, additional functionality for uh, these specific AWS services, okay? Uh, so if we just scroll down here, you see we have a nice uh, large comparison. The most important thing to note is that Shield Advance is for mitigating uh, large DDoS attacks. So if someone is specifically targeting you and sending uh, a lot of traffic your way, you're gonna wanna pay for Shield Advance, okay? Uh, another thing about Shield Advance is that we get that visibility reporting. So we're gonna get uh, a lot more information as to the nature of these attacks. Uh, we're gonna have a response team and support. So we're gonna be able to talk to people to work through that problem. Uh, and then we're also gonna get DDoS cost protection, okay? So this is gonna make sure, because when you're getting a lot of traffic, it's gonna be hitting these services, Route 53, CloudFront, ELB. And if you have a lot of traffic, that would cause you to um, spend a lot of money. So AWS gives you these guarantees that you're not gonna be going uh, overboard in costs, okay? So yeah, that's the uh, stuff I wanted to highlight there uh, for advance. Um, so yeah, there we go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at the concept of penetration testing. Uh, and so it's pen testing for short. So what is pen testing? It's an authorized simulated cyber attack on a computer system performed to evaluate the security of the system. So the question here is, can you perform pen testing on AWS? And the answer is yes. Uh, there are some uh, limitations around it, and there are some prohibited activities but uh, you can definitely do pen testing on AWS. So there are eight services you are permitted uh, to do pen testing on. So you have uh, EC2 instances, NAT gateways, and ELBs. You have RDS, you have CloudFront, you have Aurora, you have API uh, Gateway, you have uh, AWS Lambda and Lambda Edge, you have light sale resources, which are just using a variety of, of, of um, services underneath, such as EC2. Uh, and then you have Elastic Beanstalk. So those are the eight permitted uh, services, uh, and then you have prohibited activities. So you definitely cannot perform uh, uh, DDoS attacks. You can't do port fl uh, flooding. You can't do protocol flooding. You can't do request fr flooding, anything of the flooding nature, okay? And you cannot do DNS zone walking. So uh, there's that. Now, if there's something else that you wanted to do on AWS to run uh, a simulated um, uh, cyber attack or test, uh, you can submit a request to AWS and uh, they will reply up to seven days to say whether you are allowed to do so or not. Um, a year or so ago, uh, pen testing wasn't allowed at all on AWS, so they have definitely uh, opened this up so you can do uh, a lot more stuff here. Uh, and just uh, be aware that yes, you can do pen testing on AWS. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at Amazon Guard Duty. And so the question I want to pose to you is, how do we detect if someone is attempting to gain access to our AWS account or resources? And that's where Amazon Guard Duty is going to come into play. So Guard Duty is a threat detection service that continuously monitors for malicious, suspicious activity and unauthorized behavior. It uses machine learning to analyze the following AWS logs. So you have CloudTrail logs, your VPC flow logs, and your DNS logs, okay? And it will alert you of findings which you can automate an incident response via CloudWatch events or with a third-party services. And just to uh, add a bit of additional information, 
If you've never heard of an IDS or an IPS, those stand for Intrusion Detection Systems and Intrusion Protection System. And that is a device or software application that monitors a network or systems for malicious activity or policy violations. So that's what Amazon Guard Duty is. It's an IDS IPS for AWS, okay? All right, so I just wanted to quickly show you uh, what findings look like in Guard Duty. So um, I have Guard Duty uh, turned on and I have a few uh, EC2 instances that are launched which um, are just in uh, public VPCs with, uh, with uh, very exposed security groups. And you can see right away that people are already trying to SSH brute force um, into uh, my instances, because if you do have instances that are public facing with SSH, where you do not restrict the IP to only your IP, you're very likely to see a brute force uh, attacks. But you can see here, it describes what, um, what the finding is and a bunch of additional information about uh, this attack here. So um, yeah, there you go. Um, that's just uh, um, guard duty there. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and we are looking at Key Management Service, also known as KMS, and it is a managed service that makes it easy for you to create and control encryption keys used to encrypt your data. And there's three things I want you to know about KMS, and that is it's a multi-tenant HSM. Uh, HSM stands for Hardware Security Module, and this is a piece of hardware that's uh, at the AWS uh, uh, data center. I mean, there's lots of them, but um, this piece of hardware is specifically designed for storing keys within memory, so they're never written to disk. Uh, and uh, that piece of hardware is extremely secure. It's multi-tenant in the sense that there's other customers that are utilizing that same piece of hardware, and you all are uh, virtually isolated from each other uh, via software, okay? Uh, and the other two points I want you to know is that many AWS services integrate with KMS to encrypt your data with a simple checkbox. So uh, in this uh, uh, screenshot here, we have RDS where we're enabling encryption and that is using KMS, okay? So a lot of services have that checkbox and then you just choose the key from KMS and KMS uses envelope encryption. Okay, and so envelope encryption, we have an example down below. And um, the idea here is you might have a, you have a key that encrypts your data, but what is going to protect your data key um, from, uh, from uh, being encrypted? Okay, so that's what we're doing is that we're encrypting the key that we use to encrypt our data with. And that's why it's called envelope encryption, uh, because it's like putting your key within an envelope so people can't see uh, that key, all right? Um, and yeah, that is KMS. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and we're looking at Amazon Macy, which is a fully managed service that continuously monitors S3 data access activity for anomalies and generates detailed alerts when it detects risks of unauthorized access or inadvertently data leaks. So that was a very long sentence. Uh, so if you weren't following along, uh, I wasn't either. Uh, so just to reiterate, Amazon Macy, uh, it, the idea is here is that you put data in your S3 bucket and that data can be, uh, it could be sensitive data such as credit card numbers or personally identify, uh, identifiable information or it could be health record information. And so what Amazon Macy does using the power of machine learning and also analyzing your CloudTrail logs, it's going to detect that sensitive data and whether that data has a risk of being compromised or exposed, okay? So if you put a file uh, full of credit cards in plain text, uh, and you upload it to um, your S3 bucket, uh, Amazon Macy is going to say, hey, we found some credit cards and it's plain text. You should probably, I don't know, encrypt this and, and archive it and make sure nobody has access to it, okay? So that's the role of Amazon Macy. Now, Macy has a variety of alerts, uh, and this kind of gives you an idea the kind of things it can detect. So ransomware, someone trying to... Uh, um, uh, lock you out your data and make you pay for it. Privilege escalation, so someone uh, trying to get access to stuff that they're not supposed to. Um, identity enumeration, somebody that is trying to uh, enumerate over the list of stuff that you have to figure out uh, what they can steal. Information loss, if you've lost data, cred credentials lost, so if you have stored credentials there and they were lost. So uh, there's a bunch of alerts that it can alert you on. The other thing that it can do is uh, it will identify your uh, most at-risk users, which could lead to a compromise, okay? So if you have someone on your team and uh, you know they're just having very poor practices and accessing sensitive files very often, they're gonna rank it based on this um, uh, these uh, badges, okay? And it's funny because you think bronze would be the worst user, but platinum is actually the worst user. So the, the nicer the badge, the worse uh, this user is, and you have to give them uh, that attention, okay? But anyway, that is what Amazon Macy is.
Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at security groups versus knackles. Okay, and so these are both used to act as firewalls within your VPC, uh, but the utility of these are slightly different. Okay, so just knowing the difference here is a good thing to cover, especially when we are in the security section here. So uh, looking at security groups, they act as a firewall at the instance level, whereas knackles act as a firewall at the subnet level. So in that diagram, you can see that all those instances um, are contained within a security group and they can span multiple subnets, whereas the knackles sit in front of the subnets and they're gonna control access in and out to, uh, from subnets, okay? Uh, now, security groups implicitly deny all traffic, and so you have to create allow rules to get access uh, to things, okay? And so that's both for inbound and outbound, okay? Uh, so the idea is that if you wanted to open up port 22 so you could SSH into an instance, that's an allow rule you would create on that security group. Now, with knackles, you can uh, allow and, and deny rules, okay? But um, the, the real utility here with Knackles is that you can block a specific IP address known for abuse, okay? Because you can have deny rules and you can say exactly, I wanna deny exactly this IP address. So the reason you can't do this with security groups is that because implicitly denies everything, in order for you to, um, de uh, to deny a single IP and allow everything else, imagine all the IP addresses in the world, right? You'd have to, create allow rules for everything uh, uh, for those IP addresses and just exclude that one IP address, which is like almost impossible. So for Knackles, the best use case here is again, block a specific IP address known for abuse. Okay, so hopefully that um, uh, helps you understand security groups uh, versus Knackles. Um, and that's all we need to know here. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at AWS VPN, which stands for Virtual Private Network. And what this uh, service does is it lets you establish a secure and private tunnel from your network or device to the AWS global network. And so it comes in two variations. We have site-to-site -site VPN and a client VPN. So what is the difference here? So for site-to-site, -site, this is where you securely connect on-premises uh, networks or a branch office to your uh, AWS VPC. Uh, and then for the client VPN, this is where you securely connect users to AWS or on-premise uh, networks. Okay, so uh, the idea here is that you are, uh, for site-to-site, -site, you're connecting an entire office um, or network to AWS. And the client is just like, imagine you have um, some uh, uh, employees and they have laptops and they're, uh, or they're working from home and you want them to connect them to the AWS network. Uh, that's what you're gonna be using. So just uh, know that you can do that and it is a private tunnel and it is secure uh, and that there are these two variations here. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we're doing a bit of variation study, and we're gonna look at services that have cloud in the name, because I want you to know that even though they have similar names, they're completely different services, uh, and I just don't want you to get mixed up uh, with these things. So we're gonna learn about all the services that start with cloud, starting with CloudFormation. So CloudFormation is infrastructure as code, and it sets up services via templating scripts such as YAML or JSON. It is used for provisioning lots of resources on AWS, okay? Moving on to CloudTrail, this is for logging all API calls between AWS services. So I always say it's about who you can blame. Okay, then on to CloudFront. CloudFront is a content distribution network. It creates a cache copy of your website and copies uh, uh, that content to servers located near people trying to download your website, okay? It's gonna be using edge locations to do that. Then moving on to CloudWatch, which um, is a collection of multiple services, okay? Uh, and so starting with CloudWatch logs, any custom data or log data, so memory usage, Rails logs, or Nginx logs. Then you have CloudWatch metrics, and these are metrics that are based off of the logs. I like to think of metrics as um, graphs because that's how they're represented. So it's like your log data. So like if you want a memory usage graphed over time, that's CloudWatch metrics, okay? Then you have CloudWatch events, and this is uh, triggers uh, triggers an event based on a condition. Uh, so you could have uh, a condition where every hour it takes a snapshot of the server, and these can be based off of metrics or, um, other, or log data, okay? Then you have CloudWatch alarms, and these trigger notifications based on metrics. Then you have CloudWatch dashboard, and this creates visualizations based on metrics. And the last one here on our list is Cloud Search, and it is a search engine. So let's say you had an e-commerce 
e-commerce website and you wanted to add a search bar to search across all products on your website, uh, uh, unlike uh, just or just like Amazon.com, uh, that's uh, what you would use. Okay. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and now I just want to cover uh, services that have Connect in the name. All right, and so uh, there are three services with Connect. They are totally all unrelated, but let's learn a little bit about these three so we can distinguish them, okay? So the first on our list is Direct Connect, and it is a dedicated fiber optics connection from your data center to AWS. So this is uh, ideal for large enterprises that own their own data center, and they need to uh, have insanely fast connection directly to AWS. If you need uh, uh, to secure uh, these um, connections, you can also apply a VPN, it was VPN on top of Direct Connect, okay? Uh, next is Amazon Connect, and this is basically a call center in the cloud. So you get a, a toll-free number, it can accept inbound and outbound calls, and you can automate uh, automate like a phone system within it. Uh, last on our list here is Media Connect, and it is the new version of Elastic Transcoder. It converts videos to different uh, video types. Uh, so if you have a thousand videos and you need to transcode them into different video formats, uh, then, uh, or if you had to apply like a watermark or insert in an introduction video, this is what you would use, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and I just quickly want to do a comparison between Elastic Transcoder and Media Convert. The, both these services transcode videos, so it's a little bit confusing, but I'll just tell you a bit of the story here. So Elastic Transcoder, a coder is the old way. It was the first service uh, that came out that could uh, transcode videos into streaming formats. So you have a video in one format and you want to turn it into another format. Uh, and so AWS came up with another service called AWS Elemental Media Convert, and it is the new way of transcoding videos. Um, I don't know if they rebuilt it from scratch, but it, it has the exact same use case, except it has additional features that Elastic Transcoder cannot do. So you can overlay images, you can insert video clips, you can uh, uh, do uh, extracts for captioned data. It has a much more robust UI. Uh, so at one point, I believe that people were still using Elastic Transcoder because it just had better integration uh, with the AWS API, but I'm pretty sure Media Convert has caught up. And anytime you're using Elastic Transcoder, AWS is always telling you, hey, go use Media Convert, okay? But Elastic Transcoder is still around because I'm sure they have customers that are, 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 are pretty much used to it. And these things are priced pretty much the same, okay? So you're not gonna really save money by using Elastic Transcoder, but there is the comparison for you. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and I want to just do a quick matchup here of SNS versus SQS uh, because these are easy uh, services to get mixed up because they both um, have something to do with messaging and they both are used for application integration. So they connect apps together. So let's look at SNS first. So SNS, uh, which stands for Simple Notification Service, it is using PubSub, uh, which is publisher subscriber uh, uh, messaging model. And so with it, it passes along messages. Whereas with uh, Simple Queue Service, uh, it is a messaging service, but it's all about queuing up messages um, okay, and so with Simple Notification Service, it's just passing them along, whereas with SQS, you can get a guaranteed of delivery, okay? Now, going back to SNS, uh, SNS sends notifications to subscribers of topics via multiple protocols, so it can use HTTP, email, uh, it can also send it to SQS, it can also send text messages, and it can send to Lambda uh, as well there, which I just don't have listed. Okay, whereas uh, Simple Queue Service, uh, you place messages in the queue and, the, and you have applications pull the queue using the AWS SDK, all right? Back on the SNS, so SNS is generally used for sending plain text emails. I really gotta emphasize that because it cannot do HTML emails, which is triggered via other AWS services. So the best example is billing alarm. So if you've ever had a billing alarm and it's been triggered, it's going to send you a plain text email, okay? So that's the exact use case there. Uh, SNS does have the ability to uh, retry sending in the case for HTTPS. Uh, so that's when you are sending webhooks, okay? Um, so that it, there is some kind of retry functionality there. Um, now moving over to SQS. So SQS can retain a message for up to 14 days. Uh, they can send them in sequential order or in parallel. They can ensure only one message is sent. They can ensure messages are delivered at least once. 
Okay, and so there's the comparison there. And just the last part here. Uh, so SNS is really good for webhooks, simple internal emails, or triggering Lambda functions. And we have SQS is really good for delayed tasks and uh, queuing up emails, all right? And if you needed a comparison of other similar services for SNS, if you've ever heard of Pusher or PubNub, that is basically what SNS is. And for SQS, if you've ever heard of RabbitMQ or Sidekick, that's what SQS is. So there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and I want to do a comparison here between Inspector and Trust Advisor because both of these uh, services uh, have a security component uh, involved in them, and so they're easy to mix up, okay? So Amazon Inspector, uh, it is designed to audit EC2 instances, so you can audit a single instance or all the instances within your region, uh, and, uh, and so it would run a script. Uh, which would then uh, run against a security checklist and it will come back and report to you uh, what checks have uh, passed or failed. Uh, so there is one very popular benchmark by the CIS, which will do 699 checks, okay? And the other side, we have Trusted Advisor, and Trusted Advisor doesn't generate a PDF report. There probably is a way to um, export a CSV or something, but it's not like something that is um, promoted with Trusted Advisor. Um, but it gives you a holistic view of recommendations across multiple service, services and be best practices. And so it has a whole section on just security, okay? So it would tell you something like, hey, you should really enable MFA on your root account. Um, so Inspector is really just about EC2 instances and, and making them secure or hardened. And Trust Advisor is all about uh, multiple uh, AWS services and security practices, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and I just want to quickly uh, cover the three different types of load balancers so you have an idea of their use case. So before Application Network Load Balancer existed, all there was was Elastic Load Balancer, and uh, now it's been renamed to Classic Load Balancer, and it basically does the job of both Application Network Load Balancer, but it has a, a way fewer features, and it works uh, slightly different, okay? So Classic Load Balancer does not use target groups, uh, and it's intended for applications that were built with the EC2 Classic network in mind, okay? So generally, you do not want to launch a Classic Load Balancer. You, you still can, but you're going to want to use Application and Network Load Balancer because they are specialized uh, for uh, their individual use case. So for the Application loads, Load Balancer, it's working at Layer 7. Layer 7 is the application layer, so it's dealing with HTTP and HTTPS traffic, okay? Uh, and so if you're running a web application, this is what you're going to want to use. Uh, it has some advanced routing rules. Uh, so it allows you to uh, get more usability out of your load balancer. So uh, prior to this, if you uh, needed a load balancer for, per subdomain, you'd have to uh, launch a load balancer uh, for each one. But now you, with routing rules, you can uh, route all subdomains uh, to the single load balancer and make sure that it goes to the right instances that you want to target, okay? Uh, and so with Application Load Balancer, you are able to attach a WAF. WAF stands for Web Application Firewall. And so since it's uh, Application Load Balancer and Web Application Firewall is just for applications, it makes sense why you would be able to attach it, okay? Now onto uh, the network load balancer. This operates at layer four, which is the transport layer, and it's dealing with IP protocol data. So this is where you are dealing with TCP and TLS traffic, where extreme performance is required. So think video games, think real time. Uh, so think about ha uh, handling millions of requests per second while maintaining ultra low latency, okay? It's also optimized for sudden and volatile uh, traffic patterns. So uh, that is another advantage uh, there. Okay, and then all these load balancers, you can attach the Amazon Certification Manager so you can apply SSL certificates so uh, you have HTTPS traffic. Okay, so there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. I'm just going to do a quick matchup of SNS versus SES. Uh, and so these two services are easy to confuse because they both send 
emails, okay? So let's learn the difference. So SNS, which stands for Simple Notification Service, it is uh, really intended for uh, practical use cases and internal use cases when it comes to sending emails, all right? Uh, so with SNS, you can send notifications to subscribers of topics via multiple protocols. So we're not just limited to email, but we have HTTP, email, SQS, SMS, and we can also do lambdas, all right? On the other side, we have SES, which stands for Simple Email Service. Uh, and this is really uh, utilized for uh, professional emails, marketing uh, emails, all right? And so it basically is a cloud-based email service. So if you've ever heard of SendGrid, that is what SES is, all right? So going back to SNS, SNS is generally used for sending plain text emails, which is triggered via other AWS services. And the best example here is billing alarms, okay? So if you've ever had a billing alarm, uh, and it's been triggered, it would send you an SNS plain text email. It's an ugly email, uh, but it does the job, okay? Uh, over onto SES. SES sends HTML emails, and it can also send play, uh, uh, plain text emails, whereas SNS cannot do that. So SNS cannot send HTML email. So if you want something that's going to look good, you're going to have to use SES. SES can also receive inbound emails. SES can create email templates. You can use a custom domain name uh, or a name name for your email, and you can monitor your email reputation. So there's a lot of other stuff that is going on there with SES. So you can see it's really optimized for emails. Um, so yeah, there you go. So that is the uh, comparison there. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. I just want to do a quick comparison between Artifact and Inspector. And um, the reason why is that they both compile out PDF reports. So that is where some confusion can, uh, can happen. Uh, so I just want to uh, clarify the difference between these two services. So Artifact uh, is all about why should an enterprise trust AWS? So does AWS meet uh, specific uh, um, compliance frameworks such as uh, SOC or PCI? Uh, and Inspector is all about how do we know this EC2 instance is secure? Can you prove it? Um, and so it runs a script that analyzes your EC2 instance and then generates out a PDF report telling you uh, which security checks have passed, okay? So that is the difference between these two services, but just be aware that they both compile out PDFs. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and I congratulate you for making your way through the journey content. And so now all that's left to do is to do some practice exam questions, and if you're scoring all right, that means you're ready to go book your exam, which I'll show you here in the next section shortly, okay? So there you go. All right, so now it's time to book our exam, and it's always a bit of a trick to actually find where this page is. So if you were to search AWS certification and go here, all right, and then maybe go to the training overview uh, and then click get started, it's going to take you to adibus.training. And this is where you are going to register uh, to uh, take the uh, exam. So in the top right corner, we are gonna go, have to go ahead and go sign in. Uh, and I already have an account, so I'm just gonna go and uh, log in with my account there. So I'm just gonna hit sign in there. Okay, and we're just gonna have to provide our credentials here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and fill mine in and I will see you on the other side and just show you uh, the rest of it here. All right, so now we are in the training and certification portal. So at the top, we have adibus.training and to get to uh, booking our exam, we gotta go to certification here. And then we're gonna have to go to uh, uh, our account and we're gonna be using the uh, certain metrics um, uh, third-party service that actually manages the AWS certifications. So we're gonna go to our uh, a certain metrics account here. And uh, now we can go ahead and schedule our exam. So we're gonna schedule a new exam. And down below, we're going to get a full list of uh, exams here. Uh, so it used to just be PSI. And so now they all have PSI Pearson View. These are just a, um, a network of um, uh, uh, training centers where you can actually go take and sit the exam. For the CCP, you can actually take it from home now. It's the only uh, certification you can uh, take from home. It is a monitored uh, exam but uh, for the rest, they have to be done at a data center. And so I'm just gonna show you how to book it either with PSI or a Pearson view here. And again, they have a different uh, data center. So if you do not find a data center in your area, I'll just go uh, give Pearson view a look so that you can actually go book that exam. 
So um, let's go take a look at an exam. Um, so maybe we will uh, book the professional here. So I'm just going to open this in a tab and open that in a tab. And we're going to review how we can uh, book it here through these two portals. So let's uh, take a look at PSI. This is the one I'm most familiar with, OK, um, because Pearson View wasn't here the last time I checked. But uh, so here you can see uh, the duration and the confirmation number. You want to definitely make sure you're taking the right exam. Sometimes there are uh, similar exams like the old ones that will be in here. So just be 100% sure before you go ahead and do that and go and schedule your exam. Uh, and so it's even telling you that there is more than one available here. And that's fine. So we'll just hit continue. OK. And then from here, we're going to wait here and we're going to select our language. OK, and then we get to choose our data center. So the idea is you want to try to find a data center near you. Uh, so if I typed in uh, Toronto here, so we'll enter a city in here like uh, Toronto. I don't know why it thinks I'm over here. Um, and I'm just going to hit uh, Toronto here and we're going to search for exam centers. OK, and then we are going to have a bunch over here. So the closest one in Toronto is up here. So I'm going to click one. All right. And it's going to show me the available times that I can book. So uh, there's not a lot of times this week. Generally, you have to. it has to be like two, three days ahead. Uh, every time I booked an exam, it's never been the next day. But here, we actually have one. It's going to vary based on the test center that you have here. But you're going to go ahead here. And this one only lets you do Wednesdays and Thursdays. So if we had uh, the Thursday here at 5 PM, OK, and then we would choose that and we would continue. OK, and then we would hit uh, continue again. All right, and so the booking has been uh, created. And in order to finalize it, we just have to uh, pay that. It is in USD dollars, okay? So you'd have to just go and fill that out. And once that's filled out and you pay it, um, uh, then you are uh, ready to go sit that exam. So that's how we do with PSI. And then we're gonna go take a look over at uh, Pearson View. So I'm just gonna go ahead and clear this uh, because I'm not uh, serious about uh, booking an exam right now, okay? And we'll go take a look how we do it with Pearson View. So um, here we are in the Pearson View uh, section to book. And uh, you first need to choose your uh, preferred language. I'm going to choose English because that's what I'm most comfortable with. And uh, we're going to just hit Next here. And uh, the next thing it's going to show us is the price. And we'll say Schedule this exam. All right. And uh, now we can proceed uh, to uh, scheduling. OK, so we'll just proceed to scheduling. It's giving me a lot of superfluous options. All right, OK, hello, let's go. And uh, here we can see locations in Toronto. OK, so here are our test centers. And we uh, do actually have a bit of variation here. So you can see there are some different offerings. You might also see the same data center. So I can choose uh, this one here. OK, and it lets you uh, select up to three to compare the availability. So sure, we will select three. And we will hit Next. OK, and we'll just wait a little bit here. All right, OK, hello, let's go. And uh, now we are just going to choose when we want to take that exam there. So we do have those three options to compare. Um, and so, you know, I just choose that 11 time, OK? And uh, so then we would see that information and we could proceed to checkout. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are at the end here. So I hope you sat your exam and you passed. And when you do, I definitely want to hear your feedback. Um, I do appreciate any kind of criticisms uh, you do have of the, the course curriculum here, uh, of, of any regards, and definitely be sure to uh, share with me uh, your success on social media. So whether it's LinkedIn, Twitter, or Instagram, I want to hear from you, okay?